kia ora, congratulations and welcome to part two orientation. So I'm Jemima, one of the law advisors at the Student Centre, so I'll be emceeing your welcome. So just an overview of today's program, we'll begin with a welcome from the Dean of Law, Andrew Stockley, followed by um, the structure of LLB part two by Professor Warren Swain. We will then hear from the course directors of your part two courses. This will then be followed by study techniques and tutorials by Professor Warren Swain. We will then have your introductory lecture for Law 298 by Stephanie Carr. We will then hear from Corda Higgins, our <coughs> careers <laughs> advisor. And then we'll hear from Kylie Ryan from University Health and Counseling on wellbeing. Julie, Julia Tomey will then present on a safe, inclusive and supportive law school, as well as Han Hannah Wilberg. And then we'll have an introduction to student societies followed by your barbecue. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, the Dean of Law, Professor Andrew Stockley. On behalf of all the academic staff at the law school, can I just say congratulations because um, you'll know from everything that you had to go through last year that uh, only a minority of students who do first year law get through into second year law. And um, so I know there's a lot of strain, there's a lot of work that you've had to do, and so very well done on being here. Um, you'll find, unfortunately, that it doesn't get easier once you do get into second year. So second year law is also quite challenging. One of the reasons is in first year law, of course, you learn about how to read cases, how to read statutes. And then in second year law, if you've already got um, the case books, uh, you would have seen there's a heck of a lot of cases, and some of them are quite long. And so what you need to do, because law is all about uh, the development of the law, the way in which Parliament, the way in which the courts um, develop our law, and to be effective lawyers or to be effectively trained in the law, you need to actually be able to use that material and to work out what the law is from it. So therefore, it'll be very important during the course of the year. There'll be a heck of a lot of reading, but there'll also be coming to terms with, I think, a whole lot of the key concepts as to what the law is about. So there's a whole lot of, I think, conceptual thinking uh, that takes place at second year. In my own subject, in public law, all, all sorts of concepts like the rule of law, the separation of powers, um, and in the United States at the moment, there's all sorts of questions about the rule of law and the separation of powers, but then how does that apply in our own jurisdiction? The legal and constitutional place of the Treaty of Waitangi, all of these are really big questions you'll be looking at in public law. In torts, uh, concepts include the duty of care, what is causation. In criminal law, what is the difference between strict or absolute liability offences? In contract law, what exactly is an offer and acceptance of a contract? What is consideration? So there's a whole lot of conceptual thinking that needs to take place. There's also a whole lot of practical dimensions in second year law as well. I've already mentioned the fact that you're learning um, how to derive the law yourself um, from the materials, from the writings of judges, uh, scholars, and the statutes of parliament. But there is, um, we have instituted a, about two years ago, I think, um, a course on legal writing, research, and communication. And that's because no matter what you learn about the law, what you're going to need to do uh, when you go out into all sorts of different careers is to be able to apply it, to be able to communicate it, to be able to write about it. And so, uh, what you'll find in that course is there's a whole lot of practical hands-on exercises where you draft you know, client memorandums or um, if you draft a statement of claim for the court. So there's a whole, and you take part in a negotiation exercise. So it's again, how do you actually use what you've learnt and be, and be able ultimately to talk about the law with clients or to judges or with other lawyers. So all in, all in all, I suppose what I'm saying is there's quite a lot of continued hard work and application that is needed. And so when I look at students who succeed from second year on, onwards uh, and those who sometimes don't, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious uh, the sorts of things that will be important, but I'll just say them very briefly. The first one is turning up to your classes, your tutorials and your lectures. Um, because in the end of the day, if you develop those good habits, and by the look of some of the spare um, bags of whatever's inside those Auckland Law School bags. Um, a few people uh, may have um, not developed that good habit already, might have overslept this morning after orientation events the night before, I don't know. Um, 
But whatever the case, actually turning up to your classes, hearing what the people who are experts in the field and who are going to be setting your examinations uh, actually have to say about the law is an incredibly good habit because ultimately if you don't turn up in court when your client is due to appear, your client loses the case. If you don't turn up when there's a meeting between two companies and you're representing one of the companies, you're never employed again. So it's very useful to get into that sort of habit um, straight off. And it's amazing that some people don't. That when you go to your lectures, you will see some empty seats. But those are the people who uh, you know, won't be on the other side uh, when you go into legal practice, ultimately. Um, but preparing for the class is also absolutely important. So I would say, you know, when you do get readings, when you are told that a certain case or statute will be looked at, Read it in advance, because if you're sitting there making notes and you have no idea actually what the lecturer is talking about, they can't always go at the level of simplicity that means you, know, you haven't bothered to do what is necessary, because at the end of the day you have a whole lot of hours every week that aren't taken up by the classes, so get in that habit of reading the materials in advance so you understand what's being talked about, because that actually will make it a lot simpler and a lot clearer. And again, that's again a useful habit for employment later on, because ultimately this is an opportunity you have. That opportunity won't come again, because if you don't get through part two law, if you crash and burn, um, you know, there's all sorts of consequences to that, to being able to continue to do law or not. But equally, if your knowledge is fuzzy, if it's blurred or it's unclear because you didn't put the work in, that equally is not going to be very good um, for your developing enthusiasm for the law or an ability to practice it well. But anyway, you have got through the biggest hurdle this law school can offer, so I suppose the message in what I was just saying is, don't stuff it up now. <laughs> you will find that there's a whole wealth of opportunities here available to you. You have joined, or you are now part of a law school that is unconditionally, unashamedly, the best in this country. We are ranked among the top 30 law schools in the world in the 2018 rankings. And given that there are some 5,000 law schools around the world, I think that's a really incredible tribute to the calibre of our academic staff um, and to the calibre of our students and what they go on to achieve. We have the highest entry standards in New Zealand, as you'll be aware of, um, but that also means you'll have a really good cohort with you and you should be able to proceed at a faster and better place than in some other places and employers will prize that. Here you have the largest range of undergra undergraduate electives, so when you get through the stage two compulsions, you'll find there's a whole raft, about 50 electives each year uh, that you have to choose from. There will be the opportunity later in your degree to go on a student exchange to do a semester of law at another top law school around the world and about one-fifth um, of, of our final year cohort do that. So really do seriously consider that because I think that can be transformative, open people's eyes to how law is practised elsewhere. Um, and there's all sorts of internship opportunities as well in international courts and in other, other opportunities um, so take advantage of that, talk to the student advisors. Um, you know, if, an, if finance is an issue, there's all sorts of ways um, to try and make those sort of things possible uh, to people who would like to take part. There are, of course, a whole raft of clubs and societies that you can join here. Um, the Auckland University Law Student Society, I dare say I'll be coming and speaking to you later about all of the academic workshops, all of the um, social drink, uh, all of the sporting sort of events um, that they uh, uh, will be putting on. Um, but again, I know that they have you know, a, whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of things about careers, workshops, um, academic programs, and again, just that getting to meet everyone else, because in the end you're in a cohort of 380 other students, um, and the more people that you get to talk to in lectures, in tutorials, um, and, and in the sort of social and other events that are organised, um, I think you know, th then you find people you can talk to, you can ask questions uh, about the courses that you're doing, and that will also make things quite a lot easier going on. We have a wonderful competition programme, so again, do think of taking part in some of those practical schools activities that are available, from witness examination to client interviewing um, to, uh, to mooting. And mooting, of course, is um, mock advocacy, mock as, as if you're appearing in a lawyer in a court. Uh, and I think when I look at it, we've got you know, by far the most extensive mooting programme uh, of any of the law schools in this country. We send students who do very well to a variety of international competitions. And again, I think it says something for um, the way in which people really can develop their advocacy skills here. The most prestigious mooting competition in the world is the Jessup International Law Mooting Competition. And last year, two Auckland University students were ranked the best speaker in the world 
and the third best speaker of the world, which really are truly exceptional achievements. So hopefully if some of you get involved, uh, that's the benchmark uh, that you have to aspire to. Um, and perhaps finally, just on clubs and societies, again, I'm aware there's a whole raft of other clubs and societies. Tarakoturi, our Pacific Islands Law Students Association, I know provide very close supportive communities for our Maori and Pacific students, and so that's really important you know, to become involved in that and to become involved in the work um, that those um, societies do. Our Rainbow Law Society, I know again, is a close and supportive environment for our LGBTQ students. We have um, the Auckland University Law Review, is a law review, a published law review, that is run entirely by students, edited by students, and entirely publishing student work. And it's looked at by the judges, it's looked at by members of the profession. So again, that's something uh, you can become involved with. We do have another law review, uh, which some of you may have attended last year, which I think is singing, dancing, caricatures and the like. Um, but again, um, that's been very successful over the years. Some of the videos they've produced um, have been seen by millions of people worldwide um, when they've sort of parodied rap songs and the like. And um, I think that's probably a greater sort of, um, I don't know what you call it, exposure to um, or greater sort of uptake rate uh, than many of the articles published by academics if you can reach millions of people through those sorts of videos. But again, there's a lot of fun and enjoyment to be had. And perhaps the last society I'd mention is the Equal Justice Project, which again, a lot of students get involved with and do really good work helping out in community law centres, looking at giving legal advice to charitable organisations that can't afford the cost of lawyers, and again, looking at how can the most vulnerable members of our society be assisted and how can law students here assist in providing legal advice to people who cannot afford it. We of course also have a raft of societies for international students and all sorts of other areas. So what I'm saying at the end is work hard, get involved, take advantage of all of the opportunities that you are here because certainly don't glide on the surface. There is no excuse for mediocrity because you have an incredible opportunity having got through into part two law and if you make a real commitment, if you open your minds, I think you'll find law can transform your thinking. Law permeates all areas of society. We have banking lawyers, takeovers lawyers, we have sports lawyers, we have entertainment lawyers, we have uh, lawyers who deal with problems in the health system, because every area of legal of, of activity in society, if there's an issue, if there's a problem, if someone's not doing what they should, it is the law that can be brought in to redress it. When there are major issues of inequity and social injustice, it's the law that can be brought in to redress it. So just remember that a law degree does enable you to step out and to take on challenges in any particular area. And that probably is why you'll find about half of our law students go directly into legal work and about half of our law students go into all sorts of other careers. And that's something, in fact, we're very proud about because people from this law school are leaders in all areas of society. Yes, some end up judges, three of the five judges on the Supreme Court, including, including the Chief Justice, are Auckland Law School graduates. And the Chief Justice, I think, is coming to speak here at the Law School in a few weeks' time, so look out for the notice on that. Take advantage of going um, to hear her and to question her, um, because we're hoping to get a number of judges in to talk about their careers and about what they see as important in the law during the course of this, of this year. And we have lawyers in the major law firms, but we also have people who have found that learning about the law, learning those skills of analysis, of reasoning, of writing, can be incredibly important for them in all sorts of areas. So we have people who are business leaders, the chief executive of the Virgin Group, uh, who works, who's Richard Branson's number two person, the chief executive of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, are our graduates. People who head um, local hospital boards, who head transport authorities, are our graduates. If you look at Parliament, um, I, I think of the National Party leadership contenders, and there seem to be even more of them every day, um, but at least two of them are our graduates. Um, from the Deputy Prime Minister to other members of Cabinet, um, they are our graduates. When I looked at the new MPs elected to Parliament last year, 15% of the new MPs were graduates of this law school, and across Parliament as a whole, one in 10 members of Parliament as a graduate of this law school. Now in some ways you do worry, why is it the behaviour in Parliament's not better? Um, <laughs> why is it some of the results you know, aren't what we would achieve if we're stocking one in ten? But I think it does show that there are people who want to do things, who have used a law degree from this place um, and have gone on um, to try and do things in society generally. 
So, I mean, those who um, aren't concerned, I suppose, with um, having it as immediate an impact on society or earning lots of money, of course, there is the possibility of an academic career. Um, so we have, of course, the possibility of becoming a professor, um, an academic in the law school. So there's all sorts of ways in which you can use the law. But anyway, well done. Take up the challenge. I trust that you um, enjoy this year um, and you enjoy the rest of the day. And on behalf of my colleagues, well done on getting into second year law. I would like to now introduce Professor Warren Swain to speak on the part two structure. Welcome uh, to you all. Uh, my name's Professor Warren Swain. I'm the Associate Dean Academic Teaching and Learning, which makes me responsible for all our undergraduate teaching and assessment. Um, those of you who are studying contract will have the unfortunate and dubious pleasure of me at 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, <laughs> Sadly, my office did not allow me to pull rank and move the lecture slot to a more civilised time, <laughs> but there we are. Um, I will uh, begin, uh, as the Dean did, by congratulating you on reaching uh, part two. As you know, the uh, demand for places uh, vastly outstrips the supply. Um, the consequences, though, of having a high entry standard um, are both good and bad in the sense that they give rise to uh, a deal of anxiety. But there are positive aspects of this too, notably uh, the advantages that it gives you in terms of your employment prospects. So to all of you who've worked very hard to get to this point, I would uh, take this opportunity to congratulate you. So where do we go from here? I'm going to say something about the uh, degree structure very briefly. But in your um, bags, you ought to have this document, uh, the Auckland Law School handbook. Perhaps we could uh, turn to that. And you'll see if you uh, turn to uh, page 12 of that uh, handbook that there is a diagram on the structure of the LLB. You'll note that as a professional degree, it's structured rather differently to the general bachelor's degree, such as the BA, the BCon, the BSc, etc. And that's because there are certain courses that you need to take in order to meet the uh, requirements of the New Zealand Council for Legal Education. The law degree consists of a mixture of compulsory and elective courses. The compulsory uh, courses are in blue and the um, elective courses are in red on the diagram. You see that part two consists entirely of compulsory courses, so uh, legal research and writing and other communication which 10 points is the first one you must take, whatever else you are doing. So you need to enrol in Law 298. Then you'll note that there are criminal public talks and contract, each weighed at 30 points. And then as we move to part three, there's a mixture of compulsory and elective courses. And Part four, apart from a means of checking that you've done enough writing and participated in moots and so on in Law 498, part four consists entirely of elective courses. 
as for the elective courses, you don't need to take a specific number of them. The elective courses come in three sizes, large, medium and small, or 20, 15 and 10. What matters here is the number of points rather than the number of electives. And part four consists only of elective courses, so each year there are around 50 to choose from, some of which uh, are in the summer school, typically four or five. Others are in the first and second semester. As the dean noted, it's also possible uh, for students to go on exchange to universities overseas, and around, as he noted, a fifth do so. There are specific exchange arrangements with other law schools, and there are the general university exchange agreements that the University of Auckland participate in. There are actually, in all, around 100 possibilities that are available to you. And you are able to get credit from those courses in other jurisdictions for your LLB back in Auckland. In respect of the co-joint degree students, which is almost all of you, the structure is set out for you uh, um, in the um, in the document on oh sorry in the handbook on page fourteen. You'll note though that it says a sample co joint degree structure. In other words, a typical co-joint degree structure. So while some students beginning part two, as most of you are, take criminal and public alongside legal writing and communications, it's not necessary for you to do so. Um, some of you won't do so. As long as you're doing legal research, writing and communication, and at least one other course, then your enrolment is entirely valid. And there's no need to worry that you don't follow the exact arrangement in this diagram. If you're unsure about enrolments or what you need to do in relation to enrolment, then you should seek the advice of the student centre they will be very happy to assist you in questions relating to the structure of your degree. There is, though, one myth I'd like to dispel, and that's this. You are not required to complete all of Part 2 before taking courses that fall under Part 3. But a word of warning here, that many of the Part 3 courses have prerequisites. So if a course has a prerequisite, that means that you must have completed an earlier course before you are able to enrol. Prerequisites are necessary <coughs> because courses at Part 3 and 4 build on existing knowledge before you really can get a grip of that course. Note, though, that there are different prerequisites for different courses, and you should check this very carefully. It is extremely unlikely, except in the most exceptional circumstance, that I will waive the prerequisite requirement. That, as I say, is for the very simple reason that those later courses build on earlier knowledge, and if I waive the requirement, you won't have the requisite knowledge to undertake the later course. 
Now, last year, we went through all those courses very carefully in discussion with the course directors to ensure that all of those courses had carefully thought out prerequisites. So just as you go into the degree further down the line, just make sure that you check that carefully. It's not an immediate concern for you now because you're in part two, but just at least you're at the beginning of part two, but just make sure that when the time comes, you check that quite carefully. The other thing I'd just like to briefly mention as part of the degree structure, and for something now that seems long in the future, is the honours degree programme. The honours degree programme is different to the honours degree programme in other faculties in that it's shorter, it's has fewer credits. However, it still stands as a non -as, uh, an honours degree. Admission to the honours programme is on the basis of your uh, grades in earlier courses. And admission is determined by a B plus average on your law courses. As I say, that's something to bear in mind for now, but the honours course is taught by a seminar and then there is a 15,000 word research uh, dissertation. Um, I'd just though, like to finish by saying a few points about housekeeping, at least housekeeping being a euphemism for faculty and university regulations. Uh, this point people's eyes usually glaze over. I have to say I find regulatory matters highly fascinating <laughs> and indeed I spend most of my spare time on university committees dealing with such matters. However, for your purposes, we've gone into a, we've gone to some trouble, or I've gone to some trouble, uh, setting out the regulations as they apply to you within the pages of the handbook, which I should add is also available through the website online if that's easier. Though quite why anyone wouldn't want this by their bed, I'm not quite <laughs> sure. Um, and the important, um, it at least smells nice, as all new publications <laughs> do. Um, the important bit for your purposes begins at page 30, academic information for students. I just here highlight a few of the key ones. Simply because I really, really, really want to avoid any of you falling foul of these regulations. The first is in relation to penalties. Penalties are applied for Late, the late submission of work and for work that is over the word limit. Note for the word limit purposes that footnotes count for word limit. So there's a little box on a word document to include the footnotes in the word count. Please um, tick it. The second thing I'd like to highlight are extensions. I very well appreciate more than most that there are a whole variety of reasons why students might not be able to submit their work on time. A whole variety of very good reasons why students may not be able to submit their work on time. If you are unable to submit your work on time, 
you ought to go to the student centre and meet with the student advisor. The student advisors are the ones who deal with extensions. Not the course directors, the course lecturers or the tutors. The course directors, however, do have an extremely important role in your education in part two. It is the course directors who should be your first port of call with queries or questions relating to the particular course over which they are the course director. I'm very pleased at this point to uh, introduce the course directors from part two. Um, I am going to be uh, standing in for the course director of part two contract. I am not Professor Dawson. Uh, and I'll begin, uh, we'll begin with criminal law and Professor Tolmey. Thank you. Kia ora kato katoa, ko Julia Tolmi Takuengoa. I'm the course director for criminal law. And I'm here, I'm firstly going to add my congratulations to getting into law school. Um, you guys are very privileged. I'm always of the view that privilege comes with responsibility. Um, and you're in for an amazing ride. What I'm going to do today in the brief time that I have to talk to you about criminal law is Firstly, make a little bit of a case for the relevance of criminal law. I don't have to. You, you, Council for Legal Education has said you have to study it anyway. But I know my colleagues and they're all going to talk about how their course is the most best and amazing course in part two. So I'll start by doing that for criminal law. And then I'll just say, make a few comments about how the course is going to be taught this year. So we do know that one-fifth of you that go into legal practice are going to practice criminal law. Um, if you don't go into criminal practice, you go into government policy work or a range of other areas, criminal law is also really relevant. But even if you don't, say you go into company law or tax law, increasingly the criminal law is used to back up and reinforce other regulatory regimes. So it's still good to know about. I'm going to slightly digress now and read a letter from one of our alumni, which I received when I was editor for Eden Crescent. Um, which is our alumni magazine, goes out to all. Um, it'll follow you around the world uh, once you graduate um, from Auckland. And when I was editing it, every year when there was a particularly good edition, I'd get letters congratulating me um, on the edition from alumni. So this is one of them. Written in December 2012. Dear Julia, I write to compliment Hi. you on the 2012 edition of Eden Crescent. And then the author goes on to say which articles he particularly enjoyed. Thank you, Julia, and editorial support team. Much appreciated. Unfortunately for me, I am currently in custody in Mount Eden, awaiting trial on a raft of charges involving alleged financial malpractices. <laughs> um, and then he goes on to sort of talk about the fact that he's been denied bail and his trial's not occurring till 2014, end of 2014. War now, I now contemplate a guilty plea. Enough of that, I would, if convenient possible, um, have back editions of Eden Crescent. The paucity of reading material here is just fact. So my point in this is that not only might criminal law be professionally relevant to you, you never know when <laughs> at some point it might be of personal relevance to you. Um, there's something that I always do, and it's always interesting to me. I'm going to segue now into a little exercise. Um, it might take a little bit of guts, but I'm just going to ask those of you who have ever committed a criminal offence in your lives to put your hands up. Well, we have some very honest human beings. <laughs> we also have a room full of highly unusual and weird human beings. 
Um, basically, if you haven't put your hand up, you've never done one of the following things. You've never smoked marijuana, you've never taken ecstasy or one of the designer party drugs, gone to a dance party, you've never committed theft, that means you've never taken something without someone's permission. Um, even if you're hoping you won't damage it and you plan to return it. You've never assaulted someone that has contacted their body on purpose without their consent or threatened to do so. You've never used indecent or offensive words in a public place. In other words, <laughs> sworn in a public place knowing someone could hear you. You've never said words to someone in a public place intending to insult or offend them. You've never urinated in a public place. I'm pretty confident 50% of the room hasn't done that. 60%. Urinated in a public place, uh, rather not a public toilet, knowing that someone could possibly observe you. You've never attempted to bring into hatred or contempt or excite disaffection against Her Majesty or the Government of New Zealand. You've never attempted to do any of those things. So I think this little exercise is interesting because if we're honest, basically if someone hasn't put their hand up, they're actually weird. <laughs> Seriously unusual to get to your early 20s and not having performed one of these actions. The exercise is interesting because it tells us what criminologists started to discover in the 70s, which is that criminal offending is normal in the population and that there's a huge body of what we call the dark figure of crime, which is criminal offending that is never charged and never ends up in the criminal justice system. So basically, most of us have had lives that have insulated us from being charged or convicted, being processed through the criminal justice system, even though we've breached the criminal law often multiple times in our lives. That's an interesting thought to take into the study of criminal law, to think about why that is. Unfortunately for our alumni who sent me the letter about Eden Crescent, those insulating factors had ceased to operate in his particular life. So actually the study of criminal law is immediately and personally relevant to all of us because in a sense we've all committed criminal offences, we just haven't had the label criminal attached to us. So turning now to say a few words about criminal law, we're going to teach it in three streams this year. Um, so class sizes will not be too large. Uh, we have a fantastic teaching team. Um, obviously, I'm course director. We also have Dr. Fleur Tiaho teaching, who taught it last year. Dr. Kate Doolin, who's a highly experienced teacher in criminal law that we've just secured from the University of Birmingham. Um, and Dr. Anna Hood. Um, and this is a team of teachers that has a huge interest in restorative justice, um, alternatives to incarceration, and in the case of Dr. Fleur to Aho, Māori and Māori approaches to justice um, and Indigenous human rights. Um, so what we do in this course is we teach uh, basic criminal principles, how you analyse a criminal offence um, and understand its legal requirements. We cover a selection of the most serious offences and defences. Um, we cover different ways in which you can be liable and we deal with sentencing law. So we have um, lectures that you must attend in three streams. You have to stay in the lecture that you're assigned to. Um, and we teach sentencing law in the tutorial program. And we've revived something we were doing at some point with a great deal of success, and that is um, the sentencing moot in tutorials. Um, so in the tutorial program, you will learn basic sentencing principles. You will then uh, produce a written sentencing submission and an oral sentencing submission. Um, in front of a judge, and the final part of the tutorial program will be exam preparation, answering uh, factual problems. So I look forward very much to seeing you next week. So now I'd like to introduce Professor jo Janet McLean to speak on public law. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Janet McLean, tēnei. It's my great pleasure to welcome you, to add my words of welcome to those of, that you've already heard, to law school. Uh, I'm not so interested in criminal law, though we talk a bit about criminal law because it's a branch of public law, so we, you know, we like to bring everyone into, the, um, into our realm, if you like. Um, I'm interested in power. That's what I'm interested in, uh, possibly because I don't feel like I have that much. Um, I'm interested in 
who has the power, what kind of power it is, how legitimate it is, how it's defined by the law and how you hold power to account. And thinking about where you might end up, people I went to law school who I was sitting next to on a day like today, uh, one of my friends from those first weeks of law school is now a court of the appeal judge. But another of those friends who I went to law school with is now the Minister of Justice. Now between those two, who has more power? What sort of power do they have? How do they exercise it? And who gets to hold them to account? That's what we're interested in, in public law. And that's the way that we've structured the teaching for this year. In the first half of the year, we look at the different institutions of New Zealand government. Uh, we'll look at the legislature. We'll look at um, ju the judiciary. What happens when a judge goes bad? How do you hold a bad judge to account? Uh, we'll look at the executive power, executive authority. And it's fair to say that people don't really go for public in the first semester. Um, I know because I taught in the second semester last year and people said, you're so good, it's better than the first semester. Well, this year I'm teaching the first semester, so that's my challenge, right? I have to make the first semester more interesting. The reason why the second semester is more interesting is that the second semester, you get to hold them to account, right? So in the second semester, we're looking at the Bill of Rights, we're looking at judicial review, and we're looking at the Treaty of Waitangi. So the second semester gets more concrete. It's starting to uh, show you the doctrines that confine and, and force uh, m uh, politicians to justify their power. The first half of the semester is more setting up the stepping stones, the um, structures that you need in order to understand what's coming. What are the sources of legal authority that governments exercise? How are they defined and how do they fit together? How much power does a court have in a, in a system which has no written constitution and what on earth does that mean? So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, and we have a great team in public law as well. Public's going to be taught in two streams uh, and our team is me. Uh, I start off the year for the first uh, six or seven weeks. Uh, and I'll be talking about the legislature and introducing you to the sources of law. Um, and then you'll have Dr. Anru Erewiti, who will teach you about the executive, executive sources of power. Uh, and then uh, John Ip will talk about the judges and the Bill of Rights. Uh, he gets a sexy teaching this year, but uh, that's all right. We'll try and get it back from him next year. Um, and then... Uh, Dr. Edward Willis will talk to you about judicial review, something you've probably never heard of. It's about holding executive power to account and has very broad applications in a whole lot of different spaces. And then finally, uh, we will have uh, a section on the Treaty of Waitangi at the end. And the reason we do that, a lot of people find that mystifying. We'll talk a little bit about the treaty at the beginning of the year but we'll spend a lot more time on the treaty at the end of the year, is because treaty jurisprudence brings in international law, judicial review, the Bill of Rights, Māori customary law, um, English common law, uh, uh, rules about customary law, tikanga, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we think that you're not equipped to talk about the Treaty of Waitangi in its fullness until you've got through the whole of the year. So that's why we do it that way. So I'm looking forward to seeing you on Monday. Uh, if you look on Canvas, you'll find my course outlines for the first seven weeks. You'll find PowerPoints for the first week. Um, and I expect that you'll have uh, had a look at the casebook as well. So look forward to seeing you then. Bye. So I would like to now introduce Nikki Chamberlain who will speak on Law of Torts.
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nikki Chamberlain. And to start off, no, I am not from New Zealand originally. Um, I'm from the South and not South Island, south of the United States. Uh, and no, I did not vote for Trump. So <laughs> all I can say about that is I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> And let's move on. <laughs> um, I have the privilege to talk to you today about the law of torts. Uh, Professor Joe Manning is the course director for torts. Unfortunately, she could not make today and wanted me to convey her apologies. Uh, so I am here in her place. I am one of the lecturers. There's four lecturers in the torts class. Uh, we each take six weeks of lecturing, so that's a quarter of the class. To tell you a little bit about torts as a subject, um, well, what we're interested in um, is money. <laughs> Show me the money. Um, and the reason we're interested in money is because a tort is a wrongful act by someone leading to civil liability. So a wrongful act by someone leading to civil liability. What I mean by that? Well, for example, in criminal law, if you punch somebody, okay, the Crown can uh, essentially bring a prosecution uh, for assault. That doesn't get you very far if you are on the receiving end of the punch. So what can you do? Well, you can bring private proceedings, a private prosecution for um, civil liability and tort for the tort of battery. Yes, it has a different name. It is confusing. You will learn lots about this in torts, but it's called battery. So that's an example of what a tort is. Uh, you'll start off with Marcus Roberts if you're taking torts this year. Um, Marcus is great. He's going to be talking about Accident Compensation Scheme, ACC. Um, essentially, why is it that New Zealand has far more litigation, sorry, far less litigation than the United States? <laughs> um, reason being is here you cannot sue for personal injury by accident. That's a whole bunch of fun. What is an accident? What is personal injury? Um, we'll be looking at all of that sort of thing. Marcus will be talking about battery, assault, false imprisonment, um, trespass to land, etc. I will then swoop in for the second half of the first semester. Um, we will start by trespass to goods. Um, I will make that as exciting as humanly possible, I promise. Um, I even throw in some MC Hammer, can't touch this in there. Um, you will find out why. Um, then we will talk about defamation, privacy, which are all very fun topics. Uh, we have cases relating to Catherine Zeta-Jones, Michael Douglas, Naomi Campbell. Uh, the cool thing about topics such as defamation, but in particular privacy, is that normally if it's getting to a litigation stage, um, obviously there has been some sort of public disclosure of a private fact that they don't want out in the open. Guess what? <laughs> It's out in the open and we get to read about it. Um, so that's all sorts of fun. Uh, second semester is um, negligence. So uh, we've got basic negligence the first six weeks. Um, so we have Professor Joe Manning and then Associate Professor Hannah Wilberg, uh, who will be talking about advanced negligence. Uh, negligence essentially comes down to the intentionality. So when you can sue somebody, but the intentionality is lacking. For example, somebody does something and it harms you, they don't mean to do it, but they were negligent. When can they have liability? When can you sue? So that's a brief summary of what we're going to cover in the law of torts. Um, the mechanics of it essentially taught three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, we were able to secure lecturing from 11 to 12 and 3 to 4. I don't know how we did that. Uh, <laughs> Professor Swain somehow <laughs> picked the short straw. Um, but I will be there, a box of birds, to see you at 11 a.m. Um, course book available. Um, I think a Canvas notification went around yesterday. Here is the first semester one in all of its glory. 
a very be uh, beautiful blue color, um, very calming, feel the serenity as you look at it. Um, assessment, we don't have plushage in torts, so unlike some of the other compulsory subjects, there is no plushage. And I just want to touch on this quickly because unlike some of the other classes, uh, our marking uh, uh, weighting is a bit different. We have a test which is worth 20%, again that's no plushage. We have an essay worth 10%. Again, no plusage. <laughs> um, then we have a moot for 5%. Uh, everybody will be required to do a moot. This is a great opportunity to try uh, a little bit of um, advocacy if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, please do not stress about that. There will be support to uh, assist you. Tutorial attendance. We give you points for attending tutorials, yay! So basically, um, there's 5% for tutorial attendance. Um, and you need to attend four compulsory tutorials and then your moot, that's the 5%. You do not have to attend other people's tutorials unless you want to. Why would you want to? Well, because they're gonna be arguing about things that we're discussing in class and it could be advantageous to you to do so. Um, clinics, want to mention something about this briefly. There are four clinics in the year. They're optional. They are taken by yours truly. Um, I will be talking about test preparation in one, test feedback in one, essay preparation in one, and exam preparation in one. Essentially, uh, we will be going over past exam problems, test problems, and I will be giving some handy hints to help you along the way. Uh, you will need to sign up for clinics on Canvas. As I said, it is optional. Uh, I will send around a message on Canvas uh, shortly, probably at the beginning of next week, so that you can all sign up for a class. Uh, lastly, uh, lecture recordings. Um, we've made a decision as a group this year that we will allow lecture recordings. Yay! <laughs> However, the little caveat to that is that we're going to post them at the end of the week. Uh, and that's just to incentivize people to attend uh, the lectures. So they'll all be posted in one go at the end of every week. Um, yeah, I think that that's basically it. So it was lovely meeting all of you. Uh, I appreciate your time and congratulations. Uh, being a lawyer is a real privilege and uh, all of you are now becoming part of the club. So congratulations and I will see you in torts. Thank you. So now I will welcome back Warren Swain to speak on law of contract as well as study techniques and tutorials. Um, uh, along with my other segments, I'm here to say uh, something very briefly about the law of contract. As I noted, I am not Professor Dawson, though it was slightly disconcerting in the teaching evaluations the other year when Professor Dawson and myself were referred to those two old English guys. <laughs> um, but there we are. Um, we've heard uh, in some detail about the... Uh, fun and frivolity, excitement and relevance and importance of the other part two courses. Uh, my segment is somewhat more Eeyore-ish, but I would note that, um, of course, contracts in reality are the, is the type of law that you are much more likely to come into contact with than any of the other kinds of law mentioned by my colleagues, um, assuming that you are not a recidivist criminal offender, then contracts are something that you're used to dealing with you know, all of the time. Contract really uh, divides into two neat parts, in a sense, that 
And one can think of these two parts in two ways. One can think of them as semester one and two, of course. But one can also think of the law of contract as a relationship. Semester one is when everything is marvellous. The Valentine's card has been received. The chocolates and flowers have been exchanged. The dinner dates have been had. You have gazed lovingly into each other's eyes. I think we'll draw a veil over the discussion at that point. <laughs> but it's where everything's going well, everything is rosy. And that's a bit like the first semester of the law of contract. It's where the parties are getting on. It's where the parties have entered into an agreement. It's about the mechanics of forming that bond or that relationship. Semester two is the inevitable. <laughs> the rows have started. The dates have been missed. The frustration has shown. The performance has ceased. <laughs> As with the law of contract, the parties are at loggerheads. One is refusing to perform, or both are, or worse, one or both are performing badly. <laughs> Semester two deals with the question of contract breach and remedies that are available for breach of that contract. If you want to think of it in another way, you may think of contract as being like Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. For those of you not familiar with Gothic novels, I suggest that you Google it. It has usually been thought in other universities that I have taught the subject in that I am more uh, Mr Hyde than Dr Jekyll. However, this year I am Dr Jekyll. This year I am teaching the beginning of the course in semester one. Um, indeed, in semester two I will be in Cambridge on sabbatical, but... Semester one then consists of contract formation, offer and acceptance consideration, topics like that. Semester two consists of the remedies for breach, uh, etc. I'd just say, though, a more general word about the material for the law of contract. The main resources are found on the Canvas page. You will have received a message from me through Canvas uh, over the last weekend uh, alerting you to this. The casebook is available as a PDF and also available for purchase. There is no set course book, though the recommended reading, if you are rich, is Burroughs, Finn and Todd. Um, however, the library do have a number of copies of those. A new edition has come out. I have to say that the first chapter is greatly improved, given that there are extensive references to my last book within it. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Stockley's point that academic uh, books are not widely read, I used to believe, until I discovered that some... I won't use a bad word, has pirated my monograph and it is available on the uh, web as a pirated copy. Um, quite why anyone would be interested in the law of contract 1670 until 1870 is anyone's guess, <laughs> but there we are. Um, this course is unfortunately both case and statute heavy, particularly in relation to semester two. Statute is really important. 
Now, I know this seems boring, and bits of contract law are, I'm afraid, tedious. Um, much of life, I'm afraid, is tedious. <laughs> Almost my entire existence is tedious. <laughs> And I make this point not just for the levity, but to say to you, actually, you really need to persevere with this stuff. If the case doesn't make sense first time, then you need to look at it again, and again if necessary. I'll give you some guidance when I teach that part of the course about those authorities. I can't uh, promise any exciting details of the private life of who I gather are some kind of B-list celebrities. Uh, however, what the cases are really about is illustrating principles. And it's important that you engage with them. There aren't really any shortcuts, I'm afraid, with this. In my experience over many years uh, teaching law in three different countries, that the more students put into it, the more they get out of it. And actually, it is a little bit, unfortunately, of an endurance test in that it's often the case one finds that students initially, they're quite enthusiastic, they will have read the case book. After about week two, that peters off. <laughs> Real life intervenes. There's more fun to be had than reading the contract uh, course book, so I'm told. Um, <laughs> but I would urge you to just try and keep at it. Contract does make more sense once you've done some of it. It all makes it all fits together. It's not a subject that's as equally discreet as possibly some others are. I'll do my best to make at least my segment as entertaining as possible. Um, this is taught in two streams, uh, uh, 8 a.m. Uh, is one stream, the other stream, I think, from memory is 12 till 1. Um, you will have me for the first five weeks until Easter. Um, I will be followed by Dr. Fairweather, who is joining us, uh, who has taught in Australia and the UK for the remainder of semester one. And then Professor Dawson will be teaching you for all of semester two in its entirety. Professor Dawson is uh, an authority on what used to be the Contractual Remedies Act, but which has now been consolidated in a big uh, statute a couple of years ago, last year, I think, uh, the Contract and Commercial Law Act. Um, so you'll have the intricacies of the legislation to look forward to in semester two. I did teach that material a few years ago in semester two, but I have to say... Uh, well, you'll have that treat coming. Um, <laughs> just something very briefly on the assessment. Um, assessment for this course consists of four items. There will be a test, I think, from memory in May. Uh, there's an essay. There's a final examination. And there's tutorial attendance. Tutorial attendance is compulsory with a deduction if you don't attend. Plusage does apply on this course. But note, in order to get Plusage, you have to submit all of the assessment. Equally, if you, even if you're not wanting Plusage, the tutorial essay is a compulsory course requirement. So in essence, really, given all students want to be able to claim plus arch, you need to undertake all four pieces of assessment in this course. Please read very carefully the details on that assessment 
as I set them out in on the canvas page under the syllabus. It is assumed for the avoidance of doubt that you have read the canvas page and understand the syllabus. I ho will have no sympathy whatsoever in my associate dean capacity if any student claims they didn't understand what was required of them on this course. Consider yourself duly notified. Equally on that point, can I ask that, can I note that you will be sent uh, emails through Canvas at various points on this course? Please keep an eye, uh, an eye out for those emails. Um, on that note, uh, I have nothing more to add other than to say um, you should have received an email about the course reading for the first week of the semester. We will consider the question of agreement beginning on Monday morning at 8 a.m. And I trust on Monday morning at 8 a.m. you will all be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, which is more than I will be. Um, <laughs> the best advice, I, and I know some of you are commuting, it, so I, I only have to walk from across the road, but gallons of coffee are usually a good idea. I'll try my best to make that part of the course as entertaining as I can. I'll try, if I can, to read you some poetry, as I have done, <laughs> as I have done in the past. This part of the course uh, is recorded, and the lecture recordings are available. As we taught, they will be available at the end of the week in which the lectures are delivered. I would encourage you to attend the lectures in any event, even though you can get the lecture recordings, because there, there may be some engagement, there may be. It actually, in my experience, saves time attending the lectures, because it's easy just to think, oh, I can sit in bed and listen to the lecture recordings, and that will be, uh, you know, I'll, I'll absorb the information. Actually, time-wise, I have to say, in my experience, I know it's a pain to get out of bed, especially in the middle of winter when it's dark and raining. Um, but actually, it probably in the long run saves time sitting here and assimilating the information. But I can't, of course, insist you attend. Um, but I would genuinely urge you to do so. Thank you uh, very much. I think I follow again, do I? Uh, so I'll just continue on to my <laughs> next uh, item. Now, I'm going to say something very briefly about uh, study techniques and tutorials. And here I'm going to uh, begin as a uh, usual with a poem. And this is a poem by the great English poet W. H. Auden, who many of you will be aware of. I've chosen Auden not because Auden is my favourite poet. My favourite poet, if any of you are interested, is A. E. Hausman. Uh, who is suitably Eorish, especially the later poems. Hausman, if you learn nothing today, it's that you should go away and read some poems of A.E. Hausman. There are actually, at the end of the day, some things more important than law, and <laughs> poetry and art are two that immediately spring to mind. So if you pick up nothing today, it's that you go away and read A.E. Hausman. Uh, not just the Shropshire Lad, which is perhaps his best known, but some of the later poems, which are heartbreakingly sad. They concern subjects such as love, disappointment, uh, and failure. Um, <laughs> if after reading A.E. Hausman you feel 
depressed, I suggest that you turn to my other great favourite poet, Philip Larkin, who many of you will also be familiar with. But because you're here at the beginning and we need something a bit more cheerful, let's start with W.H. Auden. W.H. Auden once wrote, Law is like love. In the poem, he contrasted different senses of the law, the law of nature, the law of religion, etc. He devoted a verse to the kind of law that you're familiar with, or already familiar with. And he said this, Law, says the judge, as he looked down his nose, speaking clearly and most severely. Law is, as I've told you before, law is, as you know, I suppose, law is, but let me explain it once more, law is the law. I know nothing or certainly very little about love, so I can't really comment on whether the comparison is a valid one. <laughs> However, it's worth reflecting on the way in which the judge in Auden's poem presents the law. It's something certain, something definite. The law is the law. And this is commonly how lay people and part two students going into the law of contract think about the law. The law's black and white. It gives us answers. It's some kind of supercomputer where everything is black and white and there are no shades of grey. The truth, I'm afraid, is more complicated. The law is often contradictory. We've got authorities that contradict each other. There's a famous case that I will don't teach this year, but an English Supreme Court case called the Achilles, where two judges say one thing, two say the total opposite, and Lord Walker agrees with both. <laughs> Make of that what you will. And it's interesting to note that Lord Walker is not an idiot. I don't have that view about a large number of English or indeed New Zealand judges, but Lord Walker certainly isn't in that category, so why? Good question. I have met Lord Walker twice and failed on both occasions to ask him for an explanation. But more usual than that, actually, is where judges reach the same result of the decision, but for different reasons, as you should be, of course, familiar with from legal method. What we need to do is to try and make sense of this complexity. Now, last year, I talked to all of the course directors from part two, who indeed are the same as this year, and asked them to identify for me what they think is important about studying law, to which I've added uh, some of my own thoughts. Between us, as is perhaps evident, uh, we all have considerable experience in teaching law, I would suggest, more than a century's worth between us, which is something of a frightening thought. So what's lesson number one? Lesson number one, as I've already alluded to, is the importance of the case law. You need to read the cases that are contained in the case books. There is a misconception sometimes amongst students in the three countries I've taught law, and I've taught a wide variety of legal topics, including tort law, land law, equity, restitution. Uh, I am a legal historian, so I teach a legal history elective, Roman law, uh, legal theory, a whole lot of things. 
but amongst all of those students in all of those subjects there are some students who think that they can go to the lectures write down what the lecturer says and regurgitate that in the exam and be awarded an A. It doesn't impress me that the student agrees with everything I say or regurgitates everything I say. Indeed, in one university, when I was younger and uh, not going to seed, one student thought it was a good idea to cover their exam scripts in hearts and write declarations of love on it in the hope that that would get them an A grade. They sadly were disabused of that notion when they received their examination mark back. But it's an important point, this. You are at the stage now where you should be engaging with the material yourself. You should come to your own view on some of the material. I'm quite happy if people don't agree with me. I'd be quite worried if you agree with me on everything. That would be uh, worrisome. But in order to properly engage intellectually with the material, you need to read the cases. All I can say about that is it gets easier. I remember what it's like to start reading the cases. I may all seem old to you, but I'm not actually that old. I read law in the 1990s, not the 1890s, and I remember what it's like. The kind of support one got in Oxford colleges in the 1990s was that who seemed to be an old man in tweed turned up. We sat in an oak panelled room. He said, here's your reading for the first tutorial. Go away and read the cases. He gave us a list of about 60 cases to read in a week. We were told to go away and read them. That was it. We sat there in the middle of the night in the olden days before it was all online, in the college library at three in the morning, went days without sleep, reading the cases, writing down everything in them. And of course it was hopeless. We didn't know what we were looking for. We just were writing everything down. We didn't know what was relevant. We didn't know what was relevant because we didn't know how to read a case. And we didn't know how to read a case because we'd not had any practice in reading a case. The more you do it, as I as guess in most things, the, be the more adroit you become at the particular task in hand. In other words, it will get easier. And it, you'll notice at one point you suddenly feel it's got really much easier. But law, of course, is about statutes as well. For some reason, students are more frightened of statutes even than of cases. You need to try and get over that initial fear, though I'd note that statutes are frustrating, even for those of us who have experience or considerable experience in reading them, including law professors and including judges. No one at your stage is a fully formed lawyer. It's really important not to expect too much of yourself straight away. I know that there's a, um, a little voice on everybody's shoulder, and it's important to note this. Everybody has a little uh, thing that sits on their shoulder telling them that they're not good enough. You need to find some kind of technique for silencing that little voice that we all have. But it's really important that you don't expect too much too soon. So just keep, honestly, you just keep at it. It's 
It's why partly these courses span two semesters. You'll find as you get through semester one, probably around the mid-semester or even into early semester two, it will start to become a bit easier. It will start a bit to make more sense. It will seem a bit to fit together more. The lectures, though, are designed to give the subject matter, hopefully, some structure and to be an introduction to crucial ideas. As I'm stressing here, you need to be responsible for your own learning, so you need to look at the cases uh, before the lecture, you need to do reading before the tutorial. In contract, I've given you a detailed lecture handout which should provide you with a structure for that material. Other lecturers will give you PowerPoint. There are some expectations about the work that you do for each course, which of course depend on the credits that a course is given. But as a rough rule of thumb, for every hour spent in a lecture or tutorial, there should be three hours work outside of it. And that work outside the classroom is critical. But where do you start? Well, you start by attending the lectures. Remember, though, it's only possible to recall roughly around 20% of what you hear. I know it's tempting to let your mind wander. I know it's tempting to send emails or go on to uh, something I'm told is called Facebook <laughs> or to go and do your online shopping. I understand that temptation, I really do. I spend a good deal of my working week in a whole lot of university committees, some of which, I have to confess, are extremely boring. <laughs> it's tempting not to concentrate on the business in hand and to deal with your emails. I can't say I'm very a fay with online shopping, although I have used the book depository and bought airline tickets, but other than that, um, actually concentration is a really important skill for lawyers. Really, really, really important. And you need to try and uh, grasp that skill. This was really brought to my attention when I worked at the University of Queensland and I used to judge moots on a regular basis with uh, judges. The concentration that those people had listening to the mooting was absolutely extraordinary. My mind was wandering, I was doodling, I was thinking about uh, God knows what, but the judges were always, always able to concentrate. And they're able to do that because that's what they do day in, day out. They have to sit there listening to this tedious, boring uh, council rambling on before them. Though I did hear an anecdote, and this is a judge who's long dead, in Queensland in the 1980s, who used to have two things under the bench when he was listening to cases. One was a magazine on woodwork that he used to read, and the other was a glass of whiskey that he kept his associate, and a friend of mine was his associate. The job of the associate was to keep topping up the whiskey <laughs> glass. <laughs> those days are gone, and those days are gone for you. So really, one skill you do need to develop is a skill of concentration. A second skill you need to develop is a skill of taking notes. The trick is identifying what's important. This, of course, is a vital skill for lawyers and one that shouldn't be overestimated. All the research on, on pedagogy, 
which is a, f a fancy word for saying teaching and learning, shows that it's best to be an active learner. And an active learner is one that engages with the content. You're just not always, you don't just sit there as a receptacle and have all the information poured over you. Active learning means putting your own order on the material. It means reviewing your notes, putting them in a way that you can engage with. I know some students find drawing diagrams and the like helpful. And putting your notes from the lectures alongside your own reading. Please don't begin this process the night before the test or the exam. It needs to be an ongoing process and an ongoing discipline. If you think, and some of you in this room will think, that you can wing it and sit the night before reading through your lecture notes and get an A in the exam or in the test, all I can say is the best of luck to you. <laughs> Many students, of course, find study groups helpful. And I would say to you that isn't necessarily a good, uh, sorry, isn't necessarily a bad idea. Some of you, of course, may be tempted to use outside tutoring firms. Of course, that's entirely a matter for you, though I would just stress two things. The first is that those firms, and there are a number of them, do have no connection whatsoever with the Faculty of Law or the University of Auckland. The second point to note is that they can make no guarantee that their materials are entirely aligned with the current syllabus. That can change from year to year. Lecturers change. Different people set the exams. Different people mark the exams. Equally, of course, they're not checking their materials for accuracy or any of those things inevitably, as they're, an or, as they're organisations that are completely separate from us. That's just a fact. It's, I'm not making any pejorative statement, but I'm just, you do well to remember that. And to say, too, that we've got clinics in tort law, as Nikki's already said, There'll also be clinics that I forgot to mention, which will be taking place in the law of contract, which uh, Dr. Carr is running in semester one and Dr. Fairweather is running in semester two. These clinics are voluntary, but I would urge you to attend them. Students last year found them really useful. Um, well, what can we do to help? Well, what we can do to help is really as follows. We offer the clinics on those courses. Secondly, you shouldn't be afraid to go and talk to the Lecturer, if there's anything in the lecture content you don't understand, you might put your hand up in a lecture. Some students do that. That's fine. You might go up to the lecturer after the lecture. That's fine too. Or you might go to their office hours. That's also fine too. But please take advantage of that opportunity. The people teaching those courses are there to assist you. And if there is something you don't understand about the content, ask them. No question is a stupid question. Indeed, many students say to me, oh, I think this is probably a stupid question. It actually proves to be an extremely incisive question. 
if you're not unsure about the content or don't find the content in places confusing, that isn't a sign of stupidity. In fact, it's a sign of the reverse. It's a sign of intelligence rather than stupidity. I find some of the material confusing and contradictory and illogical. So don't feel that this is a fault of yours, actually quite the opposite. So make sure that you take advantage of that resource and talk to the course lecturer. There seems to have been in the past some, um, how do I put this, some rumour that I am unwilling and unhelpful and do not like seeing students. This is completely untrue. I am always happy to see students between five and seven in the evening most days other than a Friday. So if any of you are in my courses, please email me and make an appointment to come and see me. If you, if you don't want to come and see me individually and need support with you, then come as a group. That's absolutely fine too. But I mean that quite genuinely. I'm really very, very happy to see any student who wants to talk to me about the course content. So don't feel that I'm in some way too grand for you to come and see. I, I'm really, it's the, the one part of my job that I still enjoy uh, <laughs> is talking to students about the course content. So please, any of you who want to, please just... Or, or get me off to a lecture. The same is true of all of my colleagues. I don't expect most of my colleagues are there at seven in the evening. Most of the rest of them have other lives, but they will equally be happy to see you nevertheless. I'd like to, though, just end with a plea. You should make the most of university. Working for your degree is important. But it shouldn't be everything. I've spent my whole life since I was 12 years old at my desk working. And I've had a whole heap of academic prizes. One of the youngest law professors in Australasia, etc., etc. But it isn't everything. Certainly, if I had my time again, I wouldn't have spent my entire life since I was 12 at my desk. And this actually is the most important thing I'm going to say to you, that you must take advantage of all the wider things that university has to offer you. I mean this most kindly and absolutely sincerely. It shouldn't just be about working. There are a whole lot of other opportunities, social and other kinds of opportunity. Though you'll also hear a bit about well-being. In the end of the day, it's a question of balance. If you don't want to end up like me, and who would, then ask, you need to actually think quite carefully about that. I know it's difficult now. I know a lot of you have to work. I worked as a student myself. I came from a poor background. I had to work all the way through my studies. I know it's hard. I really do. And I, I'm absolutely sympathetic to this. But I just would urge you to allow, within all of these commitments on your time, allow a bit of time for yourself. I'd just like to thank you all then for listening and wish you all good luck as you move into part two. Thank you. So, we've come to our break and I'd like to just say that we'll see you all back in five minutes for the 298 lecture. So back here at quarter to 11. So I'd like to now introduce Stephanie Carr, who will now present your lecture on Law 298.
Uh, kia ora everybody, how's everybody doing today, okay? Awesome, okay, so I'm here uh, to talk to you about Law 298, Legal Research, Writing and Communication for this year. Uh, firstly, congratulations on making it into part two, it's an awesome achievement, so well done to each and every one of you. I am here in place of the course director, Bronwyn Davies, who gives her apologies, she's teaching another course today. Uh, but I have responsibility for the research component of the course, so I'm instead of her. Uh, in your little pack, you have the booklet for the orientation, and if you open it up, hey, you will see Law 298 is the very first page after the ad uh, and the contents, so we must be the most important course, of course. So Law 298 is an exciting course designed to help you with the law school process and this foreign language called law. You'll have already found out how strange some of the legal language sounds to your ear. So the objective of this course is to help you decode all of this language while providing you with practical assistance to help you with your legal research and writing, not only for your law studies, but on into legal practice. So when you write your legal essays or opinions this year, you'll need to know how to analyse what you're asked for, uh, how to find relevant information and how to write it all up. And this course is going to be the foundation uh, for all of the studies that you will do at law school. Also, your case books do not have everything that you will need for your opinions and essays, especially if you want to do well. So this course will help you to research and write better. So as I said, Bronwyn Davies is your course director. Uh, her contact email is on the screen and it will be on your Canvas page for Law 298. And here is my picture um, as the Legal Research Coordinator. Uh, Law 298 is a 10-point compulsory course. You have to complete it to pass your law degree. We'll cover research, writing, communication and well-being will be integrated throughout the course. And it is a year-long course taught in small groups so hopefully you've already enrolled in your workshop classes through the student services online. I'm going to start just by giving you an overview of the course and if you miss this information we'll put the slides up on Canvas for you. But how the course will work over the semesters, you will start with the legal research component of the course for the first four classes that you come to. We work on a fortnightly schedule. Then from class five, through to semester two, you will go to legal writing classes with a different tutor and the communication elements will be for class 11 and 12. Some of the logistics you need to get your head around is that the first four classes are legal research classes held in the Davis Law Library. So when you go down the hill today for the sausage and barbecue, you'll be standing right outside the Davis. So there's no excuse that you can't find us. We're the big building right in the middle. Uh, when you get into the Davis, you go to the Bell Gully Computer Laboratory. So they are our sponsors of one of the big law firms in town. You'll start legal writing from the fifth, fifth class and you will be in a different room and that will be announced on Canvas. The classes or workshop schedule runs on a fortnightly pattern, usually from a Tuesday to a Friday. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But if you're in class one, week one starting next week, then figure out if you're in cycle for week one or two. And you've just got the starting dates and an overview uh, of all the dates and uh, weeks that are going to be covered uh, on the screen. Semester two information is on Canvas and in the course book, which I'll talk about in a moment. So what you need to work out for next week, if you're in week one, for classes one, three, five, seven, and nine, up to 35, so all the odd numbers, attend in week one, all the even numbers attend in week two. So you need to make sure you come to the correct workshop. There are two really important exceptions to the regular schedule. That there are class changes for the classes usually held on Friday the 30th of March, which is Good Friday. Those classes, your workshops will be brought forward to the Monday the 26th of March at your usual time. And also for Anzac Day, Wednesday the 25th of April, there's no classes on that day because it's a public holiday, so if you would usually attend a workshop or class on that day, 
Your classes are brought forward to Monday the 23rd of April at your regular time. So the example is if your class is usually 9 a.m. on Wednesday the 25th, you come at 9 a.m. on Monday the 23rd instead. Attendance is compulsory. So 298 requires 100% attendance at all of the classes. If you miss a class, there's an automatic deduction of five marks. And that will happen every time you miss a class up to a maximum of 50%. Again, there is more details on the class schedule, on Canvas and in the course book. If there is a problem with you attending, you get sick or there's something um, going on in your life that makes it really difficult, uh, and you can't attend your regular enrolled session, then go and see one of the course advisors, either Martina or Emily, and you must have a legitimate reason, as you saw with the video, doctor's certificate, a dentist's note, or counselling reference. So make sure you follow the rules and see a course advisor. Broman and I, as the directors, cannot grant any changes to your workshop times. What do you have to do to get through uh, with your assessment for Law 298? Uh, for the research side, there is two pieces, basically. Uh, two worksheets, which you'll get a Word document and you have to complete all the little uh, quizzes, if you like. And then there will be two online quizzes through Canvas. And we'll give you plenty of warning and plenty of details about those when we get into the classes. For legal writing and communication assessment, there will be three assignments. They're outlined in the course book and on the uh, Canvas page, so take a look at those. But the really good thing, there's no exam. So you get to go through clear at the end of the year for 298. Any announcements and information will the core, for this course will definitely go through Canvas, so make sure you've got your uni uh, email turned on or forwarded to your preferred email to get those Canvas announcements. What I'd recommend is that if you haven't already been in and had a look at the 298 Canvas page, do that before your classes. One of the key things that you should have a look at is there is under files a copy of the course book, all of the course uh, information about assignments you can put into your calendar, and also a legal resource online which I'll show you in a moment. One other aspect you need to be aware of is that from 2014 all students admitted to new programs have to complete the online academic integrity course. If you get a course code on Canvas uh, similar to that on the board, ACADINT A01, you need to complete this course. I'm assuming most of you, if you've been in stage one, have completed this, but if you are new to University of Auckland, you've got to complete the five modules and the associated tests, and you have to get all of them in 100% clearance for your answers. If you do not complete this semester, you'll be re-enrolled for next semester, and if you fail, you'll get a DNC on your transcript, and we don't want that. Okay, so make sure you do that if you have to. In regards to the legal research component, which you'll start next week, uh, all of the information is linked on Canvas, including this little module which you'll see pictured. It's uh, something you could do before class to get you prepared. And there are optional quizzes where you can self-test yourself and your understanding of the material. So this would be really good preparation this weekend, just in between the Netflix watching and, you know, the, the socialising. Log on to Canvas, go to Law 298, look at the Legal Research Online Resource, which is in the middle sort of tab, and click through the Class 1 information just to give yourself an overview. As far as the Legal Research course content, uh, this slide just gives you the outline of what the research course will entail. And because it's a practical skills course, we're going to teach you how to use some of the online materials. So for class one, we'll give you an introduction to some basic uh, research tools. Class two, we're going to give you a focus for looking at case law using the online legal databases. Class three, we'll focus on legislation, how you find and interpret and analyse all that type of source. Uh, and for class four, we're going to look at secondary sources and work on your problem methodology solving skills using the IRAC methodology. So there's a lot of work, there's a lot of information to absorb. Focus on your goal to keep you motivated, so be like the young lady and not like the sleeping gentleman. Uh, you need to pass this class to get through law school. So the legal research class is just confined to the first four rounds uh, for semester one. As we go through the legal research courses, we're going to introduce you to the legal research process, which was a 
diagram we've formulated at the Davis Law Library. The flow chart shows you each of the research steps that we will be focusing on for Law 298. It's also in your course book, so you don't need to note it all down today. So we're going to consider how you analyse and identify your issues, how you consult resources, what you need to do to update and evaluate, and how you apply all of that. So there's a big process, quite different to some of the other disciplines you've probably been working with. Why do you have to do a course about legal research? Well, it's all because there's so many different things about working with legal information. And just to sort of give you an idea of what they are, it's all about uh, the structure, the tools that you use, the way that you reference is completely different, and how it's all organised. So we're going to clarify that in the classes for you, but if you look at that Canvas online module, there are some tips in there and information for you as well. What I'd really recommend is if you go to UBook and you want to purchase the blue Law 298 course book, you can do that, uh, obviously at your cost, but all the pages are then nicely sort of bound together for you. There's also a PDF of the course book available on Canvas, so you can download that and work through that. As you look at that, there will be exercises for the research classes. We're going to do those in the classes, so no need for you to rush home and go through and try and do those all before you come to the class. So we're doing group practical exercises within the research sessions. There is a prescribed text. It's the New Zealand Law Style Guide, and this is the referencing style you will be using for this whole year at law school. It's the required style, not only for law school, but the whole legal profession. So you can purchase these from UBook, but there are copies available to borrow at the Davis on short loan, so for two hours use in the library, or just go to that website and you can keep accessing that. There's nothing to download, it's just a clickable uh, sort of tool you can go through. There is a third edition due, potentially this year, so I would actually recommend just rely on the online one for now, but if you're like me and you do like print tools, purchase the second edition from the bookshop. There are two other recommended texts, again both of these are available in the Davis for you to borrow. Uh, Peter Spiller, the New Zealand Law Dictionary, uh, you can borrow that from the law library and be able to interpret terms and phrases that might be unfamiliar to you. Legal Research in New Zealand by Mary Rose Russell also gives you a really good introduction to how legal research works and all of the tools that you will need to use. Again, you don't need to purchase them, borrow them from the library. The Libraries and Learning Services website, you've got the address there, I'm pretty sure most of you are, hopefully are aware of this website. There's a whole lot of study, research and teaching tools in there for your information. You can look up your books, key information for the sources you might want to use. Most importantly, I'm sure you already know, but this is where you source your exams from. So when it gets to the end of the year and you want to look up the CRIM exam from last year, this is the place to go and get that. We also have a law subject guide. So this is a page that's collated by the law librarian team and they've put all the resources you will need related to particular legal jurisdictions or topics in one place. So you can access some quick links at the top, including Canvas, all the law databases are in that sort of right hand side. If you want to look for New Zealand legal resources, you can do that under jurisdiction. So it's a very good idea to bookmark this page on your computers and devices. So that's an easy access point for seeking information this year. The Bell Gully Computer Lab, as I've mentioned, is where you will come next week for the first round of your 298 research classes. So when you get to the Davis, turn right once you get in the main door and you'll see room 203 pictured there. It's a very small, compact room and I'd recommend bringing uh, something warm to where it does get a bit chilly. Just in regards to my other role as the Davis Law Library Manager, we have a Facebook page um, with our mascot, Barrister Bear, or Barry as we like to call him. Uh, so you can uh, you know, like us or link to that page if you want to see what's going on in the Dave and what Barry's been up to, along with all the other Facebook pages uh, that you sign up to. In regards to writing a communication, Bronwyn's asked me just to say a few words in regards to those parts, which will be uh, after round five. So in semester one, what you'll start with is introductions and some well-being. 
There will be general writing tips, essay writing, which is crucial for this year because you will have essays to write for your compulsory classes. Then in semester two, you will look at case analysis and case notes. Some of that we will start uh, in the research classes, and that is a really important thing to do all the way through the year. They will then further progress with IRAC uh, and elements analysis, legal memos, and negotiation. So quite a full-on program for legal writing communication, but really key and crucial for your law studies this year. Uh, the legal writing teachers, uh, as I mentioned, Bronwyn is the director, but there will be a team of instructors who will be assigned to each class, and the contact details for those instructors will be made available on Canvas later in the semester. I'm sure those instructors and tutors will also give you their contact details when you first go to their sessions. So just a quick summary of the things you need to do after class today. Go um, and get the blue course book from Ubook or log on to Canvas and look at the PDF version there. Uh, and also, if you are keen, go and have a look at that Legal Research Online course that is linked on Canvas as well. Hey team, have a great year. I hope it all goes really well. Good luck, enjoy your time, remember to take time out, and we'll see you down at the Dave. Right now I'd just like to introduce the student centre team. So here we have, so next to me is who's speaking next to is Claudia Higgins. She is our employer engagement manager. If you have any questions about um, careers, CVs, what to put on it, what you want to study, what your employers are looking for, you go see her. We have Emily McGowan. Um, she is your part two to four advisor. So if you have any questions, it's to her. And she also deals with extensions. Then we have Surinjika. She is our student centre manager. Any questions at all, you see her. Angela is our postgraduate and international advisor. So maybe in the future you're wanting to do any postgraduate courses. There are postgraduate courses available for undergrads, so you would see her. We have Sosefina, she is our Pacific advisor. So if you have any queries, and you can see her about that. Then we have Tessa, she is our well-being and experience advisor so um, she'll look after for example mentoring um, com community project and internship so any questions there then we have Martina who is our um, another advisor and she looks after the 360 so if you're thinking of exchange you see her as well as um, tutorial attendance to both her and Emily and then last but not least we have Catherine who is our Poofina Maori so if you have any questions and you just see her about that. So that's the Student Centre team. We're located in Building 810. So if you have any questions, just come by any time. So yeah. So I'll now introduce Claudia, who will now speak. Hello, welcome. I feel I must follow everyone else and congratulate you on getting in here. Um, but the hard work doesn't end now, as the Dean said. Um, so, quick show of hands, who came to university because they think it will be a good thing for a career? Most of you. Um, so, I am Cloda, I am the Employer Engagement Manager here at the Law School. Um, so, essentially my job is to make sure that you guys know what careers are, how to get into them, and then as well as bring industry into the Law School to meet you guys. Um, I'm in the handbook, page 27. My big smiley face is there for you guys. So, I have a curiosity test. This is where you need to stand up, because we want to know what your conjoints are. BA. Stand up if you're a BA. Yeah. Sit down, be calm. Okay, sit down. Bachelor of Health Sciences. Just a few of you, two at the back. A Bachelor of Science. A few more. Bachelor of Engineering. <laughs> Bachelor of Music. Well done. Just a plain old LLB. Excellent. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to read out three career statements and then I'm going to ask you which one you identify most with and stand up when I read it out. So, I want to be a lawyer, and the LLB program is how I do that. I'm thinking about being a lawyer, but willing to keep my options open. I have absolutely no intention of being a lawyer, but I know the LLB degree is a great degree to have. So the first one, 
definitely want to be a lawyer. Straight LLB kids, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about being a lawyer, but willing to keep my options open. Oh yeah, there's a few of you. And I have absolutely no intention of being a lawyer, but I know the LLB degree is a good one to have. Be honest, people. My piece of advice around that is keep your options open. As you go through the degree, there will be parts of the law degree that you love. There will probably be parts that you don't love, to put it as nicely as possible. But keep your options open as to what you might do when you leave here. Anything else? Any other random career? Yeah? Oh. Do you want to share? Or? Uh, I, I like practicality awesome. We will try and help you with that. <laughs> okay. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as what recruiters look for from law students? What is expected from you guys? Anything. You guys are law students, you're going to have to open those mouths and give some opinions so sooner rather than later. Yep. A stellar personality. Communic yeah, absolutely. I think that goes for any job, but a stellar uh, personality will, will always be good. Anything else? Yes. Hard work. Hard work, yeah. They expect gr good grades out of you guys. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Anything else? Yep. Yeah, competency, absolutely. I would hope you get that from studying here. Yep. Oh, uh, it depends on what you do, but that is definitely part of the legal industry for sure. Right, this is what I'm talking about. They expect strong analytical skills out of you guys. We will test them, trust me. Those analytical skills will be tested when you're at the law degree, uh, in the law degree. Problem solving, it's a big one. Written communication, verbal communication, and a passion for what they do. Ugh. Nonetheless, passion is important. As you go through the law degree, once again, there will be bits that you like, bits that you don't like. Aligning what you like with what the real world does really helps. If you're really into commercial law, then a commercial law firm might be where you want to start your career. If you're really into criminal, it might be with the Public Defence Service. So aligning yourself and your passions with what they do is really important. Okay, what to do while you're studying. This, these are just suggestions. There is no tick the box exercise to getting a job. I wish there was, it would make my life much easier. But here are some suggestions. Maintaining your grades. Law still holds on to the GPA. Getting a bad grade is wow. not the end of the world. We can definitely work away with that, but you need to maintain your grades. You are expected to have good grades leaving here. Educate yourself in your career. Now, it sounds really obvious, but it, the responsibility lies solely with you guys. Luckily for you, I'm here. So what I do is I bring employers into you guys. They are dying to meet you. So when I send you an email, you would have got one this morning with all the job stuff in it. Register, attend, and get your personal brand out there. Get involved. Now, the law school has 10, 12 clubs and societies, but there'll also be lots of clubs and societies in your other faculties that you're part of, and also with the central campus life people. Getting involved, showing your passion about something goes so far in your career. Get some work experience. Can anyone tell me what a summer clerk is? Yep, go on, give it a whirl. That was a bit mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yep, that's it. So, <laughs> that's pretty it. So, clerkships are for the law industry, and they're essentially how you guys get trained up in law. So, there are summer clerkships that usually are available for you guys to apply to in your penultimate year, but there are opportunities throughout your entire degree where you can be gaining experience. Law experience is one thing, but general experience is just as relevant. Your part-time job in Subway or, I don't know, McDonald's is still totally relevant. It says great things about you. You can turn up on time. They don't let you not work when you're in McDonald's. You work pretty hard for eight hours. It says good things about you. Network, network, network. I can see the fear in your eyes. <laughs> this word just strikes fear into students' hearts, and I don't know why. Networking isn't a quest to get something out of some someone. It isn't you have job, I want job, give me job. That's not <laughs> how networking works. Networking is a genuine conversation with people. 
when you have a genuine interaction with people and you share ideas, information, passions, that old word again. It's really important. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. It becomes easier and easier. Now, between me, the clubs and societies, we constantly shove industry in your face. We're constantly bringing them into the law school. Do not waste the opportunity. Go get your face in front of the people who will one day hire you, would be my advice. And I'm sure everyone who has a job would share that advice. OK, the one thing I want you guys to walk away with from here is you were probably pretty good at high school. I have a feeling most of you did pretty well at high school, or if you came as a mature student within your career. Most of you got into part two, so you've already beaten some part of the competition to succeed at the law degree. You're going to get big, fat no's. It's just the name of the game when it comes to recruitment. It's not you, it's them. I like to use a little dating analogy. But when you meet the love of your life, it's beautiful. So I just want to end this by saying you're going to get no's, and it's going to hurt. It really stings. I still remember mine. I can't even look at the rejection letter. It still hurts so much. But you are going to get them. And I almost want to say, it's OK that you get no's. It's not you. It's them. But you will get there. So as well as me, we have CEDAs. Um, as most of you have already been at the university for a while, you've probably come across them. Um, so there are career development and employability services. They're up in the Kate Edgar above um, Shaky Isles. Um, they have a law expo on Monday the 12th of March. It's well worth going to. There will be employers there. They're not looking to hire you. You're a little early on at the degree program for them. But once again, you're networking. Um, but you can go to CDES for CVs, cover letters, workshops, interview tips, all of that lovely stuff. They have an online portal and they send you lots of emails with who's coming on campus and you should go. Um, so the person that you guys um, would go to in CDES is Shannon Ring. She is the law representative. Awesome. And that's all from me. You can come visit me if you like. I live in the student centre with these guys. Um, it's a busy period coming up for me because of recruitment opening on the 16th of March. Um, but if you want to come after that, you're more than welcome. Next we have Kylie Ryan from the University Health and Counselling and she'll just do a presentation on wellbeing. Hello, welcome. Um, well done, you made it through first year law. Woohoo, you got here. I once made it through first year law too and I actually got into second year law and then I decided I never ever wanted to be a lawyer in my life um, <laughs> and got poached and here I am. So. Um, Things to think about this year, I know you've probably all seen this stuff last year. Who wasn't here last year at Auckland University? Anyone come from somewhere else? <laughs> One person's like me, but not me. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit today about mental health. Um, welcome to law, you're some of our most stressed out students. You're in competition with med school. It's not a competition, okay, don't try and outdo med school on that note. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about anxiety and depression in particular today and how some of the stuff you would have seen around campus last year, we spammed you with emails, much to your disappointment, um, but how that works for you um, in your second year. So as a reminder, what we know is that one in four young people will experience mental illness while they're here. Um, once you enrol in university, you're five times more likely than the general population. If you're over the age of 25, good news. If you haven't experienced mental illness so far, you're less likely than those under 25 to do so. Okay, so there are some joys of being older. Um, so what that means, we have 42,000 students on this campus and 10,000 of them will experience mainly depression or anxiety while they're here. So it's huge. Okay, why is that? Um, I see all the time in the news, them going, it's because you look at your cell phones too much, obviously. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's genetic. So next time someone says that, particularly your parents, you can go, no, it's not mum and dad, it's your fault. <laughs> okay, that's the main cause. You have a predisposition to it. It's like other health things, like diabetes. Um, if it runs through your family, you have a predisposition. That doesn't necessarily mean that you will experience it, but you may at some point. There's always those odd ones as well that pop up where there's been no family history. Okay, but it is mainly genetic. So what is it? Um, that brain with anxiety, that blue bit in the middle, is the amygdala. If you have anxiety, you are pretty much born with an overactive amygdala. 
Okay, we need anxiety. Um, it saves us in life and death situations. If someone comes up and grabs you, your amygdala is going to pump adrenaline through your system, which is going to allow you to get away or survive in that situation. Okay, so that's a good thing. However, if you have anxiety, your brain does that constantly, which isn't such a good thing and is exhausting. Okay, so it's a bit like a lifeguard on duty at the beach who doesn't just save the people that are drowning, but thinks everyone's drowning and starts pulling them all out of the water. Okay, and coping with that all the time um, is pretty tough stuff for your brain to do, as well as achieving academically. Okay, it's usually in regards to anxiety themes, so people have anxiety in some situations and not others. The main two we see in university is social anxiety, so when we stand here and go, yeah, you should join a club and network and connect, you're sitting there going, I hate people, people hate me, I'm not connecting with anyone. Okay, and that's your brain just going over time. Some of you can overcome that. For some of you with anxiety, it's really hard to overcome that because it literally takes over your brain and stops you from doing that. The other one we particularly see um, with law students is exam and testing anxiety. If we know about it now, we can help you with that. It's really hard for us to give you skills to cope with that two weeks before exam time. If it's at the point when last year I've been sitting law exams where people are vomiting in toilets before exams, that's a full-blown panic attack. Okay, that's your body's response to an over kind of saturation of all the chemicals that your brain's running through your body. Okay, if we start working on that stuff now, we can make a difference in it. So it's worth coming to see us at the beginning of the semester instead of just before exams. The other one we see a lot of is depression. Um, there's a lot of myths around depression as well. It is a clinical illness that is most likely caused by genetics again. Okay, we know there's a hormonal imbalance in the brain. If we take a brain scan, this is what a not depressed brain looks like versus a depressed brain. The reason there are not so many lights on is your brain literally starts shutting down some of its functions so it can cope with what it needs to. That means your motivation goes means often your appetite goes, or you do the opposite and eat everything in sight. It means you probably have issues sleeping, or you'll want to sleep all the time. You'll either isolate yourself and not want to talk to people, or you'll go out and talk to everyone in sight. Okay, so it looks different in different people, but it is a clinical illness, and we can start turning those lights back on. So one of the biggest issues we have around this is if it's your first experience, it's really hard to spot. Um, if you know you suffer from anxiety and depression, Law is one of the degrees that's going to up your stress levels and make those dips come quicker. So our goal is to even out those dips so you don't drop too far. Okay, and if we start doing that now, we can get it under control by exam time. It's really hard, both of these, on memory recall. That's pretty much one of the first parts of your brain that will shut down when it comes to anxiety and depression, which is an issue when you're trying to do an exam. Okay, so it's worth having a think about. Our worst possible situation, okay, we don't want people either to just give up on their degree because that's become too overwhelming, we don't want people to hurt themselves, um, and we definitely don't want you to be alone if you're having suicidal thoughts and thinking along those lines. Okay, again, the earlier we can help you with this, the quicker the intervention is, um, so it's better for you to come to us when it's just starting to dip than when it's in full dip, but we can work with both. The other thing is when you're in that state, it's really hard to seek help yourself because like I said, the planning part of your brain starts shutting down and the motivation. Okay, you also think you're all alone in this. Everyone else around you seems to be doing really well and it's just you. Like I said, 10,000 other students, we know for sure and probably five times that amount when we look at you're enrolled in university. Okay, so do come and seek help. If you notice that friends aren't turning up to tutorials or lectures, um, or they're just acting a bit out of sorts, or things aren't going so well, don't just ignore that and hope they get better. If it's going on for three weeks or more, please suggest to them that they might come up to health and counselling and see us so we can get back on top of it again. So some of the um, things to think about. Who reached this point last, last year? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you are going to reach this point again and again and again in university, unfortunately. I'm actually okay with that. 
Um, you are about to be lawyers. It is one of the highest stress degrees, so now is a really good time to learn to deal with that stress. Um, people often say to me, why can't we just spread out assignments and make this a bit easier for everyone? You're one of 42,000 students. Okay, there's no way we can cater to everyone. So you are going to get times where we give you a lot of work and put you under really highly stressful situations. I'm okay with you reaching the top bit, but you have to meet the second part of that picture. Again, if you can't pick it back up and go, actually, I really need to do this till like 2 a.m. in the morning or 11.59 when the assignment has to be handed in by, um, then again, come and see us. Don't just drop off the face of the earth. Okay, we can put things in place for you, but we need to know about it. So prevention-wise, um, you would have seen these around campus last year. We know these work. They're internationally researched ways to wellbeing. They particularly work in regards to anxiety and depression and are very effective when that's not an issue and you're highly stressed out. Okay, we didn't make them up. Um, they've been proven to work time and time again. So the way you do this, say you're starting to have a crappy week and you know things are starting to go downhill, pick one of those parts of the bubble and add it to your week. Second week, pick another one. Third week, pick another one. If life is still crap after three weeks, please come and see us in health and counselling. Okay, that's a big red flag for us that there might be something else clinically going on that we need to address. Okay, or perhaps it's just that you've got so much stress, not only from university, but from personal relationships, from working long hours, from trying to do placements and clerkships to the rest of it, that we need to work with you around finding some balance in that. As we said, this is always an important one at the beginning of the semester, um, and it's really hard if you suffer from social anxiety as well. Okay, so some things to think about. Um, you might sit next to other people and they don't talk to you, or they seem quite snobby or standoffish, or they don't want to join your study group, um, or they're the ones sitting by themselves in tutorials. If you're the person who likes to go up and say hello to people and you're all good with that, please make the first move. Okay, because it's really hard for some people to just take that step and by you going and saying hey how's it going I'm so and so actually allows that to happen. The other thing is if you see people around campus not doing so well please just ask them if they're okay if there's anything you can do. Okay we won't have time today but we planted actors around campus last year in various states of distress to see whether people would intervene. It took four hours for someone to check in with this person and see that they were doing okay. Okay, and the other two scenarios, no one checked in to see if they're doing okay. So we really have to start stepping up um, and letting people know that there's help available. So where do you find us? Do you all know where health and counselling is by now? <laughs> that would be a no. <laughs> so we're above Munchie Mart. Everyone know where Munchie Mart is? Yay! So we're directly above Munchie Mart. You just go onto the main Auckland website. I'm going to try and type fast and it's going to turn to custard. Don't try and find health and counselling from here because this website is impossible to find anything on, as you probably know. So just put in health and counselling, <laughs> which I'm just not excelling at. I even went to school when there was typing. We're not even first, but we're getting over that slowly. We're second on the list. You can enrol for counselling services here. You don't even have to talk to anyone. We get most referrals at 2 a.m. in the morning. Okay, and they're triaged three times a day. The general wait list is about two to three days, but we also hold about five appointments a day if people need to be seen on that day. Okay, so they're always available as well. We have 20 registered psychologists. Everything is fully confidential. Your faculty can't access it. Your future employers can't access it. The only time it's been accessed is via court records in a murder case. So don't murder anyone as law students, and then we'll be fine, okay? It's fully confidential from there. The other thing to consider, particularly if you know anxiety and depression is an issue, are the wellbeing groups. These run right throughout the semester. Um, if anxiety is an issue, um, Luke runs a group for that, which is skills-based around learning to turn that amygdala off quicker, okay? So you don't get to that panic attack stage. Mindfulness, we've seen that great um, steps in this around academic performance for people. It also particularly works around emotional control, so for anxiety, but also if memory's not so great for you, this actually grows the part of the brain um, that deals with memory recall. So worth giving a go. This one makes me laugh a little bit because I'm pretty sure if you've got social anxiety, you don't really want to join a group. 
but there is a social confidence group. Um, and again, it's just people experiencing similar things to you. So if you're freaking out about the networking thing, this group will give you some of the skills to do that with not only your peers, but with future employers as well. Mood management, if you know depression's an issue, this aim is to get those highs and lows less dramatic and keep you in that balance. Um, if you think about eating and what you're putting in your mouth 24 seven and are on a diet and binge eating cycle, um, we have the top um, New Zealand specialist in this area in our team and she runs the um, intuitive eating group as well. Um, none of you are doctors yet, if you lose a parent there's a support group, rainbow men's group, um, really popular so I would register sooner rather than later. Same with the Indian Women Support Group. This year we've added a wellbeing group, which I'll be running. Um, it's a drop-in group, you don't have to register for it. But again, if you know you're having a crap week and you want to look at adding some of those things in, but you prefer having a person in front of you helping you with that instead of reading it off the internet, um, call into the drop-in group, which is on 12 to 1 every Monday once semester starts. Okay, and that's in the meeting room opposite the main health and counselling doors. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Good luck. Um, try not to get too stressed out, but when you do, remember that this stuff is here. Guys, you in particular are really bad at getting help. Okay, like I said, it's a clinical illness. Your brain is literally shutting down. Hardening up and working on your resiliency is not going to work. Okay, please come and see us and seek help. You've also got your student support advisors in the law school who can help as well. Um, other than that, I will see you at some point, no doubt. Otherwise, have a nice life. And hopefully you get the grades. We'll see you later. So I'd like to now introduce Hannah Wolberg, who will be speaking on and well-being, as well as uh, Julia told me. <laughs> yes, hi, kia ora tato. Uh, I am actually speaking just on equity and Julia told me will speak on well-being and we did in that order. Um, welcome to part two, congratulations on getting in, well done, uh, and we look forward to working with you. Uh, so my position that, uh, that's relevant for today, I'm also a part two lecturer at some stage, uh, but my, the reason I'm here today is that I am the law school's associate dean equity. Uh, and I'm here to assure you uh, that the university and the law school uh, t uh, is committed to equity and committed to working on equity. And so that's why we have a number of people um, whose job it is to work towards uh, improving our practices uh, in that area. Uh, so you might then ask yourself, what is equity? What, what, what is it that I'm working on and, uh, and introducing to you? Uh, the university website puts it as equity as fairness and justice. Uh, that's pretty well encompassing. Uh, our more specific mission uh, is to make this university, and in my case this law school, a safe, inclusive and supportive law school for all, um, not just for the members of the mainstream for whom systems tend to be designed as if they represented the entire world, right? So a safe, inclusive and supportive law school for all. So that means an obvious sort of negative thing and a much bigger and di more difficult to describe positive thing. Uh, the negative as in the what we don't want uh, is obviously discrimination is not okay, obviously hate speech is not okay. Uh, whether you're a student or a staff member, um, that, uh, that is uh, the university won't tolerate it and the law school certainly won't um, because if anyone is to be concerned about fairness and justice, it should surely be the law school. Uh, so that's what we don't do. Um, what we do want to do uh, is to ensure that all different backgrounds and needs uh, and all people's different worlds are accommodated within this law school. Uh, so to ensure that the same opportunities for all isn't just a theory uh, 
uh, but is a substantive reality for all, for people from all different backgrounds with different needs and different realities. Okay? Uh, so that's the objective. And I guess I'm sounding very serious about that, but I think it's a good thing, right? Um, it's a positive thing that we're all um, hopefully uh, in together to work for. Uh, and so, just trying to keep a bit of an eye on the time. Um, the main uh, groups that are identified by the university as equity groups, that is groups whose backgrounds and realities and worlds haven't traditionally been accommodated terribly well by mainstream institutions, uh, are um, Pacifica uh, uh, people, st uh, students in this case, we're con concerned with students, uh, Pacifica, um, and, sorry, I should have started with the one group that has a special status, not just as an equity group, but Māori, obviously, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, are a treaty partner, uh, so, uh, and uh, despite that, have, uh, uh, their world has not really been accommodated generally um, terribly well in our mainstream institutions, so that's um, a much bigger thing than just equity, but it belongs to that as well. Um, so that's the first one to mention, then Pacifica, uh, then people with disabilities uh, and LGBTI uh, students, uh, and uh, most recently added uh, people with, uh, from a refugee background uh, and from a low, lower socioeconomic background. Uh, and I suppose last but, but not least, uh, the, the university officially actually lists men or women where there are barriers to access and success. I guess the reality is that the people who tend to still uh, need uh, better uh, to be taken into account uh, are women and particularly, I guess, carers, um, which could be men or women. Was there an interjection or...? <laughs> All right. So what do we want from you? Um, from all of you, we would like you to join us in that mission and in, in that um, vision for the law school. Uh, so don't assume that your world is everyone's world. Um, be aware of other possibilities. Uh, and uh, be aware of any privileges that you may have and keep an eye out for others that don't share those privileges uh, and be there to support them. That's what we want from all of you. Uh, and from those of you who may be members of these equity groups, or indeed not a member of an equity group, but also somebody whose needs and backgrounds aren't properly being accommodated, uh, we would like you to do a number of things. Make uh, the most of the support that's available. Uh, and uh, for some of these equity groups, there are uh, special programs. Uh, and, and so I haven't yet men mentioned actually targeted admission. So one of the way that we accommodate uh, different backgrounds and needs is to, to recognise that uh, some people haven't had the same sort of opportunities in life as, uh, as others. Uh, and while the standard of merit of passing a course, the standard of getting a law degree is exactly the same for everyone, for entry we accommodate uh, the, the fact that some people have um, uh, not had the same support and, and um, opportunities so far. Uh, so that is really important to the law school and the law school is committed to that and that's why there are special support programs um, for the larger targeted admissions programs. Unfortunately, nothing formal yet for refugee background and socioeconomic, lower socioeconomic, but we're working on that. Uh, and disability as well. Um, no sort of formal group program for those, um, but formal group programs with Pacifica and the Māori program. Um, so that's part of the support available. Uh, beyond that, um, there are student advisors available that specialise in the different groups. Uh, and importantly, use your peers for support. Um, the, again, the main, the larger equity groups have student groups. Uh, that uh, where you get peer support uh, uh, to, to make it through law school. Uh, and so before I say a little bit more about um, two other things that we'd like you to do if you need support, um, I'd like to introduce um, the, the four main student groups, and hopefully we have representatives of them here, um, that represent um, the, the, the four largest groups. So firstly, uh, the... Uh, 
Māori students, um, Te Rākau Ture, so the treaty partner and uh, equity group, um, Te Rākau Ture. We've got uh, the two co-presidents here, Dexter and Nay, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. <coughs> Uh, tēnā rā tātou katoa, uh, kia ora, ko Dexter Rāpana tōku ingoa, huri nō te aroa me ngāti tūwhare tō, nō rotura ahau. So kia ora, uh, my name is Dexter and I am the co-president for Te Rākau Ture, the Māori Law Assurance Association. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, nā tāna here here uh, I come from a little place called Heaven, I mean Ahipara in the far north. Um, so you know, you know what they say, save the best for last and the worst for first. So we are Te Rākau Ture, um, we are... So, so our primary purpose is to provide uh, a fun, safe space for um, all students, but uh, especially for Māori students. So we have a um, we have a common room down in Building 810 where you guys will be attending all of your um, compulsory tutorials. So on level four, turn left. There's um there's there's the, we, we've got tables there for study groups. We have a fridge there full of milk all the time. Um, we have coffee and all those other sorts of things that keep you going during the day. Um, it's also awesome to see um, some of the people who came to our interviews um, for the, the scheme that, that Hannah just mentioned. Um, congratulations to n not only um, you Māori fellas, but everybody else who got through um, today as well. I hope you, your, yourselves and your families are um, immensely proud of yourselves because it's a massive achievement. So, uh, kia ora koutou. Ti <laughs> Um, hey guys, my name is Tara. I'm the female co-president for PILSA, the Pacific Island Law Students Association. Um, this is my sports officer, Eddie. Um, first of all, congratulations, you guys, for making the cut of 300 to 350 students out of 1,000. That's a huge achievement. You guys should be really proud. Um, so what PILSA is about, we provide academic support, pastoral support, social and academic, oh, well, academic support, but mainly like career support for Pacific um, Island law students. Um, we know that a lot of our Pacifica law students, um, they have financial hardship at home, so they don't have a lot of access to resources. Um, so we're, we're kind of that family network to provide for them. But just because we're pro-Pacifica doesn't mean that we're not inclusive, we're open to anyone to come by. Um, as well as having social, cultural events, we've got camp coming up, we've got cultural day, um, we've also got Pilsa dinner. Um, what we are really good at also promoting is our mentoring program. Um, in the past, we've been in partnership with um, a law firm, Simpson Greeson. We're in the process of also working with um, Meredith as well. Um, so what that provides is not only mentoring, you know, for uh, exams and whatnot, um, student mentors, but also we work with lawyers who can come and give you guys advice on how to, you know, prepare for interviews, start really thinking seriously about your career as a lawyer, you know, after you graduate. So you'll be looking at internship, um, interview processes, and you know the questions that they're wanting to be asking and um, the people that they'll be looking for. So um, we're just at level, uh, what was it? Four. Level four, <laughs> building across, across from TRT, building 810. So just feel, to, um, feel free to come by and uh, we'll be all open arms. Thanks. Rainbow Law um, without the co-president. You can introduce you as well. Kia ora everybody. My name is John Kingy. Hi. I'm a co-president of uh, Rainbow Law. Unfortunately, my co-president Alex Cranston couldn't Hi. be here today. Um, but basically, we're here to support um, anyone who's gender non-conforming, non-binary, queer, rainbow, questioning, or maybe you just haven't made up your mind. That's fine. Um, and basically, we provide support to uh, any students who uh, are in any of those categories. Also, we welcome allies as well. So if you're somebody who um, is passionate about the rainbow community or you have friends or family <coughs> who have experienced discrimination um, as a result of uh, their gender or sexual orientation, we welcome you as well. Um, basically, we have um, events throughout the year. Uh, we'll have a launch event uh, on the 21st of March at Chapman Trip. So if you're interested in uh, finding out a little bit more about what we do, who we are, and the events that we'll be running this year, come along. Um, and you know, congratulations on getting into law school. And just a word of advice, that uh, your grades will go down. So don't worry, um, you will, <laughs> they will. If you're used to being a, an A student, you know, there'll be about one or two of you who'll be that still. Um, but yeah, just enjoy your time here at law school. Um, make use of all the support services. We're all pretty friendly people, so uh, make sure that you get involved. Kia ora. So 
I thought we had Lauren here from the women's group as well. Uh, <laughs> uh. Hi, Lauren. Hi, I was told this morning I was speaking. So, <laughs> um, so my name's Lauren. I'm from the Women in Law group. Um, we're basically just a place for girls to get support because law school's pretty tough. Um, and sometimes it's nice to have a uh, shoulder to lean on as it's really a transition. Um, and we do some really cool uh, activities. We did some fundraising events. We did a sanitary product drive. But we also do like wine and cheese nights and go out to plays. So we really recommend you come along. It's a great way to meet girls. And we have a really like, flexible leadership structure. So we really want part twos to join and actually become part of our leadership team. So if this sounds like you, come sign up. We have a Facebook group as well. It's Women in Law, so feel free to join. That's more. Thank you, Lara. So as I said, these are the student groups that represent the main equity groups. Obviously, uh, we appreciate that other ethnic diversity, for example, is also an issue. And um, I think you'll be meeting some of the other um, groups that represent uh, those in, as part of the student societies uh, part. Um, so we don't want to uh, ignore that by any means. Uh, so very quickly, um, two more things. Uh, one is... Uh, for those people who may need some kind of ac accommodation, be sure to ask. Um, and I guess that particularly goes for students with disabilities and students with caring responsibilities. You can ask for special uh, 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 conditions for tests, for example, or, uh, or different times if you can't make it at night because of your caring responsibilities, that kind of thing. But we can't do it if you don't ask, right? Uh, and that feeds into my final point, which is that you can register... Uh, as a member of some, of some of these groups, and it helps in a number of ways if you register. It helps us to um, push information at you, it helps us to be ready to help you when you come, because we already know that you have um, this particular uh, background. Um, and it also helps the university in being aware of the numbers that there are and the provision that needs to be made. It's particularly important, I think, for LGBTI. Um, there's currently no dedicated funding for that. If we could make a case to actually show that, you know, this is the proportion of students in that group, we'd have a much stronger case um, for some dedicated funding. Uh, and so you can register your, your formal university record. Uh, you can sh uh, sh uh, currently show on that if you have a disability or if you develop a disability, which is also possible because, for example, mental illness counts. Uh, and uh, work in progress, but hopefully soon uh, to be active, LGBTI students can register as such. And obviously that's confidential information that's not going to be available to every lecturer, let alone student, but it um, serves those sorts of purposes I just mentioned. Uh, and finally, really importantly, if you are a carer, if you have caring responsibilities, if Sue's disappeared, uh, you can register now. This is a brand new system at the law school. You can register with Sue if it's children. There you are, Sue, um, on, uh, in the student centre. Uh, uh, if it's children, please bring your children's birth certificate if at all possible. If you're caring for other family members, um, Sue will find other ways um, of uh, getting that um, official and then we know that you are somebody who may need test accommodation or who um, may be able uh, to um, not attend a tutorial without a med medical certificate because you're tired or sick for example right so things like that help us to help you um, register please uh, and have a great year thank you Hi again, I'm here this time with my um, well-being coordinator hat on. Um, myself and Dr Anna Hood produced a gender report in 2016 and there have also been numerous um, well-being surveys done at the law school and what these reveal is that the law school can be an incredibly stressful and lonely place for a lot of people. So I just want to give you some key messages about that today. The first is that you're not alone. Don't keep it to yourself. Reach out. There's a list of people to contact depending on what kinds of concerns you're grappling with. Um, they could be academic, financial, careers, well-being issues such as stress or depression or personal issues that are traumatic that are making it difficult to cope. Um, or equity concerns. And you can see that list on the front page of every casebook for every um, course. 
If it's really hard to reach out to the person on the list, reach out to someone you have a relationship with and the academic or professional staff or even the student body and they can facilitate uh, that engagement. There's absolutely no shame attached. The profession needs real people and it needs sensitive people. Um, so it's great that you're there. Um, the second is, um, I think one of the things that really I found quite painful actually about putting together the gender report uh, was the realisation that we took this incredibly brilliant and talented bunch of young people, which you are, you wouldn't be here if you weren't, um, and we make most of them feel stressed and inadequate <laughs> because they're not getting A grades and they don't see themselves getting offers from a large law firm. And I really just want to carry this message that grades and um, a job with one of the large law firms, if that is our vision of success, that's an impoverished vision. It may be heaven for some people, certainly wasn't for me. I got into a large law firm and I spent my whole time thinking, my God, I spent five years getting a law degree and I prefer waitressing. <laughs> so allow yourself a journey of discovery around who you are and what you stand for and what success means for you. Um, one of my really uh, cool experiences in 2016 teaching women in the law was inviting a couple of women in to speak to my women in the law group. Sandra Alofi Vi and Laverne King, they came in and talked about their journey. Um, Sandra now gives a talk, we've got a little video of her on our Facebook page giving a, a talk about her uh, experience as a practitioner. They struggled to find employment when they got out of law school and they got really creative. They managed to scrape into jobs and they lost those jobs because their employers were retiring or going overseas. Um, and so they decided to set up their own firm, which was pretty difficult as they were young and had no money and no capital. Um, but luckily one of their employers provided them with the capital and security to get started. He's a pretty extraordinary man. His name is now Judge Philip Recorden. And this was their mission in their law firm was to run it according to tikanga, Māori, and also to employ other young Māori and Pacifica women graduates, give them a couple of years' experience so they could start their own firm. Um, and they were joined by Ida Malosi, um, who's now a district court judge. Um, and many, many firms have sprung up from their little firm. Um, they wanted it all. They wanted professional success and motherhood. They felt they had law degrees. They deserved the whole shebang. Um, so they started up a creche in their own law firm. Now, they are women that I really admire and respect and their journey is one of great success for me. And Sandra was saying, if failure was not an option, what would you dare to dream of? So I think it just comes down to thinking about what success means for you. What do you stand for? Who are you? What are your values? What contribution do you want to make? Um, and not get stuck in this idea that it's all about getting the best grades. Um, we have a little project called Humans at the Law School, which is about trying to break down barriers, um, telling different stories of hugely successful people who had failure at many points along their journey of success, um, and introduce different people as human beings and give you a little bit of insight into them, what makes them interesting, what their passion and vision may be. So you can see videos on our webpage and you can see images and little blurbs of people around the law school with these stories. If you have a story to tell, um, contact Tessa Silifant because she's putting together the Humans at the Law School uh, series. We have lots of wellbeing initiatives, including a fantastic um, group of uh, students who are champions for wellbeing, the student wellbeing group at the law school, whom you'll hear from in a little bit, and I'm sure you're welcome to join. And they have mentoring programs and organise different events and study groups for students. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to introduce Ella from um, AULS to introduce your student societies. Hi everyone, uh, first of all a huge welcome. Uh, up there is our line for law camp last year, um, so you're about to get into that now. Um, yeah, welcome to law school, uh, it's incredible that you're all here today, you're going to have the next four or five, or maybe six, years of your life are about to be the best ever. So um, 
yeah, thank you so much for coming along today. And a huge congratulations on getting in. Uh, as Nay said before, it is a huge achievement. And I remember first year as being quite stressful. Um, and I'd love to say the stress stops here. It doesn't quite. There's always a bit of stress that comes with studying law. But uh, the fun begins. It really, really does. Um, so yeah, AULSS is the Auckland University Law Student Society. So our job is to look after you. We put on lots of fun events so that you enjoy law school. Uh, we try and help you achieve the goals that you want. Uh, we expose you to a range of different careers. We put on educational workshops so that you can uh, learn off our older students who have done really well. Um, and we just here for you. Uh, anytime you have a concern or a question or you're not quite sure who to talk to, you can come and talk to us and we'll help you or we'll put you in touch with the right people. And I just want to echo what uh, Julia said before. Grades. I will say grades aren't important because <laughs> I've got lectures in the room, but they um, <laughs> definitely don't define you, okay? Um, you're going to go on to have amazing careers and the piece of advice that I have is that you will exit law school with a degree. Many times, you will. Many times I've sort of been at the library and I've got up and I'm like, that's it, I'm never coming back, but I always have. And you will too. And um, the most important thing, aside from that degree that you will leave with, is your friends and the people that you've met. So get involved, do everything, take every opportunity to meet as many people as you can. Um, and yeah, really just pursue self-discovery in these four years and find out what it is that you're passionate about and what you want to do. Um, and yeah, I think you'll have the best time at law school possible. So thank you very much. Um, also, I just want to say um, our office is located in the student centre, which you've probably all been to, I would assume. It's over the road from all the lecture theatres. We're straight as you walk in the door and we have lots of tacky photos up that yeah, we like. Um, and so we have an open door policy, so come down whenever you want. Um, also, our executive uh, is on the AULSS Facebook page, so make sure you join the group on Facebook and make sure you join the Part 2 Law 2018 page because that's our main way of communicating with you. After this, head down to law school. It's always a bit of a sprint. Um, and be careful because there is a road and <laughs> it is a bit of a hazard. We nearly got knocked out on our way up, eh, Johnson? Um, and to add to that hazard, there's actually a bit of like construction happening at the moment. Uh, so be creative, find your way down um, and yeah, line up. Make sure you get your membership, um, make sure you get your camp tickets and there's lots of cool merch available and you can mix and talk to the other student societies as well. Um, one more thing, we do not have FPOS, it's unavailable at the moment, so uh, there's an ATM up on, up in Kaiga there's an ANZ one, and in the quad there's an ASB and a, um, what is it? A BNZ I think. A BNZ. Thanks so much, can't wait to meet you. Um, hey everyone, I know everyone's like restless and you've been in here for two hours. Um, they are not actually going to sell tickets until... Um, the right time. Yeah. yeah so just, just <laughs> yeah. listen to Johnson. <laughs> um, I'm Johnson. I'm the equity officer. I kind of work very closely with Hannah Wilberg. Um, my main uh, role as a student equity officer is to be kind of just another support person. A lot of the time you don't know who to go to, you don't know what to talk about, um, you don't know who's in charge of what. Essentially what I am is the middle person. I can either direct you in the right way, um, help advocate for you. I work a lot with AULSS and all the other groups. Um, to make sure everyone's interests are kind of well represented and well thought out. Um, one of my main, well, with, with the equity officer, because it's so fluid, um, the role, I can really kind of concentrate on what I really want to do. So my main concentrations for this year are representation, so minority representation um, for any obvious reason, um, and also well-being, because at the end of the day, like everyone else has said, um, grades are not important. Well, they are important, but they're not as important as your own health. Um, Everyone's going to go through a stage uh, where you kind of sit in the day until 9 p.m., stressed out and crying, and then you're going to say to yourself, this is not worth it, and still come the next day to law school and do it all again. Um, so uh, I'm kind of just another support person to talk to, um, to say, like, if you have any problems, I don't know who to talk to. I need an extension. I've got this happening in my life. I've got that happening in my life. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know what to do. Then come see me, um, and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, but otherwise, congratulations for getting in. This is a very big feat. Um, and I hope you have a good time at law school. Thank you.
everyone, um, my name's Jane and I'm one of the co-directors for EJP. And Ella. And she's also a co-director. Um, so for all of you who don't know, um, the EJP is the Equal Justice Project and we're a pro bono charity run by students at the law school. And our values are kind of um, include inclusivity and access to justice within university but also within our wider community. Um, so we have four teams which we'd love you to join um, and they include pro bono, community, communications and access and they just all work at different aspects in order to promote these values within our community. Um, if you are a social justice warrior or you've got your eyes set on Bell Galley, like we welcome every type of law student because we really feel like these values are ones that should be instilled in all law students. So um, quick admin, our information session is on Monday the 5th of March at 1pm at the law school and we'll post that on our Facebook page if you want to give that a like and we'll be closing applications a week after that. So congratulations and hopefully we'll see you there. everyone. Um, my name's Rachel and this is Charlie and we're here from the um, Mooting Society. You've potentially seen us in first year with the first year moot, but excitedly now that you've got into part two there is heaps more opportunities to get involved and we encourage you all to sign up and participate. We help you develop your advocacy skills and really put into practice what you've learned in law school so far. Mm. Uh, so our first event for the year is the pop-up moot. So this is the first time we've done this. We've teamed up with the pop-up globe, which I'm sure most of you guys have heard about. So we're having some actors, some of their actors come in to the law school. They're going to perform the trial scene from the Merchant of Venice. And then we're going to have some of our mooses act as the lawyers and debate a legal problem. So that'll be heaps of fun. Really encourage you guys to come along to that. Uh, and then also the junior moot which is the first sort of formal part two MOOC that you can do. That'll be in April. Uh, so sign-ups are free, and you can sign up uh, at the same time as you sign up for AULSS. Cheers, guys. I'm actually also here for the Public Policy Club, which isn't specifically a law club, but it does tend to draw mass numbers of law students, so I'm here to talk about it today. So basically we're a non-partisan club which encourages students to get involved with politics. Um, we help students to make their mark, encourage education and also provide um, opportunities of professional development in the sort of political and public sphere. Um, we have a broad range of events, you potentially saw them last year, we did, um, what's it called, the Baby Back Benches and also our, our public our policy brief competition. We've also got this year, we're starting a um, political forum which will run every second Thursday so you can come along and there'll be a topic and you can discuss it openly with everyone there. Um, and also, near the beginning of this year, we're running an event around the end of life choice bill and we've got David Seymour coming in and then someone on the opposite side of the debate to discuss it openly and um, educate you all about that. Um, our values are impartiality, fairness, inclusivity and access. So no matter who you are, we encourage you to get involved. And we'll be in um, Albert Park for the club's day, so come sign up there. Hey everyone, sorry, I'll keep it short and sweet. So my name is Anusha, I'm from Salsa, which is a South Asian Law Students Association. Um, and we're very excited for this year. We have some great stuff planned. Uh, our first event is next week, Friday, which is the Hawley at Law School. It's gonna be a huge water fight with color and hopefully some food as well. It is completely free to join us. So please come see us, have a yarn, have some salsa and chips. Uh, we're not Mexican, but we do love a good salsa. So yeah, we would love to see you guys and, and congratulations for being here. It's said that every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion will be killed. Equally, every morning a lion wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the slowest gazelle or starve. It doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better be running. I'm Nadia, I lead ALSRC, the Auckland Law School Running Club, 
We're a casual club that caters to all fitness levels. <laughs> We're a casual club that caters to all fitness levels and we have twice weekly runs after lectures around Auckland City. For more details, check out our Facebook page and we'll be down at law school after this, so come say hi. Um, what's up guys, so my name is Sundaresh and this is Mohammed and we are from the Law Association for International Students and um, we are basically a Law Association for International Students. <laughs> um, we do both social and academic events and um, so, if you, so if you're like paying 40 grand a year in tuition fees you should come hang out with us. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Tarika from Not Your Average Law Students, or NILES for short. Um, obviously there's no such thing as an average law student, um, but as you've heard, people come to law school from all different walks of life with um, different experiences and through different paths. Um, so we have people who might have been working in a different career and want to change, or people who've been raising a family and still have parenting responsibilities or caring responsibilities and other people who've just been doing other things with their life before they decide they want to be a lawyer. Um, so Niles is here for those people who have those kind of other life experiences and um, didn't follow that typical, typical pathway of just coming to law school straight, straight from high school. Um, we all understand that law school is really stressful, um, so it helps to know that there's other people here who have similar experiences and understand the kind of pressure of trying to juggle law school with the other parts of your life that you can't just put on hold while, while you've decided to return to study. So Niles is about creating a way to make connections with those other people who understand what it's like. Um, we have a few get-togethers during the year and one of the things that we've done and we'll do again this year is bring in guest speakers who've come to the law from different pathways. Um, so for anyone here who um, doesn't think they want to just go to a big firm and follow that kind of path into their career, um, obviously we'd welcome you to come and um, learn about other things that you can do with your law degree after a few years of study. Um, so check out our Facebook group and I'm looking forward to meeting you. Hi, I'm Mike, I'm from Veritas. And Veritas is a, a, a group of Christian law students. And we get together because if you're a Christian and you're a law student, we have quite a lot in common. Um, <laughs> all right, so we meet weekly in the law school and we've got some stellar Bible studies planned. And I think as law students, it'll be one of your best times in your life to, un to get to understanding the Bible because we get quite good at understanding a text in light of its purpose. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> all right, so you don't have to be a Christian to come along. Um, and that's because the opportunities to openly and honestly discuss matters of faith are really rare. And you know, we also host bigger events. In the past, we've hosted talks by prominent lawyers and judges. But really, Veritas is just an opportunity to take a break from the really highly competitive nature of law school, um, you know, make a few friends, and sort of explore your faith. So if you're interested, we'll have a stall, a stall set up at law school after this. And you can also like our Facebook page. So that's Veritas Christians at Law School.